In fifth place, we have Diamond Proof of an SA Scandal. Alrighty, can I get a show of hands? What's the first thing you think of when I say priest and scandal in the same sentence? Do those two words have the initials SA? I had a feeling. So those are words that this platform doesn't really like, so pardon me while I try to dodge them, and I apologize in advance for how comical I'm about to sound. This affair kicks off on June 22nd of 2023, when the Society of Jesus of Bolivia acknowledged that it had received from the Vatican a copy of the diary belonging to the late Alfonso Pedreja who was a priest accused of taking advantage of dozens of minors. He died of cancer in 2009, so he never faced repercussions for his actions in his lifetime. Primarily known as Father Pica, he was placed in boarding schools for impoverished youth, primarily in Cochabamba in the 1970s. So the diary was turned over to the prosecutors in that same city for that reason, and it was discovered that the late priest kept detailed accounts of the underage horrors he committed in Bolivia. So at one point, according to his diary, he told a colleague about the crimes, only to be advised not to mention it in future conditions. Confessions. Ah, uh, yeah. The good old ignore it and it'll go away approach. The priest's nephew, Fernando Pendreas, discovered a printout of the diary in an attic and turned it over to a major newspaper. And in its pages, the priest wrote lines such as, I hurt so many people, too many. The newspaper publishing excerpts from the diary prompted an outcry in Bolivia and an official Vatican response. Go figure. Pope Francis promised to ensure the full cooperation of the church to work alongside the government as it investigates the allegations. He also expressed sorrow over the ongoing revelations in the Catholic Church, calling them deplorable. Yeah, okay. And remind me again, what does uh, full cooperation mean? Coming from an institution that covers up more than it discloses, pardon me if I take that with um, a pound of salt. Bolivian President Luis Arce has called on his country to strengthen controls to prevent foreign priests with, you know, a history of sexual crimes from entering the country. Which, you know, it's fine, and obviously I support that, and, you know, great. But it's hard to find that out when the church is super skilled at covering things like that up. Priest Jordi Bortomio, a sex crime investigator from the Vatican, arrived in Bolivia back in May to gather information about prevention efforts being undertaken within the church to stop these kinds of crimes. Well, that sums it up right there for me, folks. The church has its own sex crime investigator. It's such a problem that they have a specialist. And before someone feels like fighting me on this, specialty jobs like that only exist because there's a need and a problem. That's not the kind of job that just got created out of midair for kicks. The investigation into Pendrejas joins at least 12 other ongoing judicial probes into allegations of clergy sex crimes in Bolivia. So the Bolivian Episcopal Conference has said, you know, one priest has already received a 10-year sentence for his crimes, while another priest, Milton Murillo, was sent to pretrial detention for three months in May. New testimony against Murillo emerged in the wake of the Pendreja scandal as prosecutors called on survivors to step forward. Okie dokie. Time to move on before I start hissing like a tea kettle, and I swear by the end of today, I'm going to turn into a caricature with like a storm cloud over my head. In fourth place, we have a drastic loss of support. So in Germany, people who are formerly members of a church pay a so-called church tax that helps to finance it in addition to the regular taxes that the rest of the population have to pay. If they register their departure though with local authorities, they don't have to pay it anymore. Granted, there are some exceptions for like low earners, folks who are jobless, retirees, students, and etc. But I'm pretty sure here in North America, all money given is through donation and you just, you know, stop going on your own terms if you want, but it's more complicated elsewhere. But also feel free to let me know in the comments if I'm wrong because I'm not a certain expert on Catholicism. Anywho, more than half a million people formally left the Catholic Church in Germany last year, which was significantly higher than the previous record. The German Bishops' Conference said specifically that over 522,000 people left the church last year, which is up from from around 350,000 in 2021. In comparison, only 1,447 people joined the Catholic Church, which was around the same as the previous year. The departures left the number of Catholic Church members in Germany at nearly 21 million, which is just under a quarter of the population. Now, the Bishops' Conference didn't detail reasons for departures in this annual release of statistics, but many people have turned their backs on the Church in recent years, you know, amid follow from scandal over bad things done by clergy and others. Wow, I'm shocked. In 2018, a a church commissioned report concluded that at least 3,667 people were harmed by clergy in Germany between 1946 and 2014, with more than half the victims being uh, under 13 and nearly a third of that served as altar boys. Various dioceses tasked law firms or others to put together reports on their own past handling of these cases, which has led to massive tensions in the Cologne Archdiocese, where the Archbishop, Cardinal Rainer Maria Wolkai, drew widespread criticism for his handling of a report he commissioned. His offer of resignation has been pending with the Pope for 
months. Now, an independent report in the Munich Archdiocese, where the late Pope Benedict served as Archbishop from 1997 to 1982, last year faulted the handling of cases by a string of church officials, past and present, including the then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger himself. The head of the Central Committee of German Catholics, an influential organization, said she was sad but not surprised at the number of departures last year, and has uh, called for reforms and more thorough investigations. Yeah. Good luck with that one. I ain't holding my breath. In third place, we have the Vatican Bank. So formerly known as the Institute for the Works of Religion, the Institute, or the IOR for short, it was founded in June of 1942 by papal decree of Pope Pius XII. So uh, anyone want to guess when they presented their first public operations report? Come on, give it a try. Nope, not anywhere in the 1900s. 2013. Yep, that's what I said. 70 years later, they produced their first, uh, annual report. You know, the thing that's supposed to be held every year. Previous to all this, all internal ledgers were destroyed every 10 years in accordance with their policy. So the IOR's rule is to safeguard and administer property intended for works of religion or charity. And the bank accepts deposits only from top church officials and entities, and is run by a president, but overseen by five cardinals who report directly to the Vatican and the Vatican Secretary of State. So they only report to themselves. For reference, all banks that operate here in Canada have to report to the Minister of Finance. Just saying. Former bank president Atore Tateshi and the Vatican Bank have been investigated on two separate occasions for money laundering. In March of 2012, JP Morgan Chase closed a Vatican account in Milan after the IOR was unable to respond to questionable money transfers. In 2010, Italian authorities seized 30 million from a Vatican account at Italy's Credito Artigano Spa, following allegations that the IOR violated anti-money laundering laws. Now, Everybody denied wrongdoing, and no charges were ever filed. The money was released after the IOR promised to pass measures to come into full compliance with international standards on money laundering and terrorism financing. In September 2019, German Cardinal Reinhard Marx, who was in charge of the Vatican's Economic Council, confirmed that Pope Francis had instructed him to reduce costs in an effort to eliminate a deficit that is estimated to be around 70 million euros. Don't get excited though, that's not a concrete number from them because, you know, that would be way too transparent. The exact amount is up for debate because the Vatican had not published a budget since 2015 and has been without an in-house auditor for two years or more. And uh, pardon me while I'm gonna blink real slowly here. The Vatican enjoys a property tax break for all non-commercial properties containing a chapel. So using this loophole between the years 2006 to 2011, the Vatican evaded taxes that amounted to 4 billion euros. The European Court of Justice ruled this illegal and the Vatican had to cough up those uh, euros as tax because you know, every kind of organization has that money lying around. And no, the Vatican did not entirely pay for evading taxes. It is argued that if you take into account the taxes that they evaded dating back to, let's say 1992, they would owe over 13 billion euros. Yeah, I'm moving on before my eye twitch gets worse. In second place, we have the chronovisor. No, this isn't some weird, you know, hat or goggles. Italian Benedictine monk Pellegrino Ernetti claimed to have used a time viewer which could film the past without sound and used it to obtain a photograph of the crucifixion of Jesus and view scenes from ancient Rome, including a performance of a very lost play. Now, this was mostly scrubbed away in history until like 2002 when author Father Francois Brun swore in his book, Le Nouveau Mystère du Vatican, that the chronovisor not only exists, but he learned about it in the early 1960s, a day after he met scientist priest Father Pellegrino. For the first time, the two were sailing along the Grand Canal of Venice discussing biblical interpretations when uh, the father explained that theories and interpretations were unnecessary when one could see the truth for himself. So he explained to our lovely author how the chronovisor functioned, allowing the viewer to both see and hear events of the past and future. And hey! If you don't believe my word, his full account is in that book I mentioned earlier. So with a little digging, researchers will find first mentions of the chronovisor in a 1972 article published in the Italian magazine La Domenica del Corriere entitled, A Machine That Photographs the Past Has Finally Been Invented. Belongs to the Vatican, and this chronovisor time machine is heralded as one of the papacy's best kept secrets. It's said to be replete with three precious alloys, cathodes, dials, levers, and has the ability to display myriad historic events in biblical and Roman history. So appearing Apparently, since it acts as some sort of television, it can verify all of this. Now, this time machine is claimed to have been invented in the 1950s by a dedicated and secret team of Italian scientists, including who I've already mentioned. Mr. Pellegrino himself. Critics may take credibility issues with the fact that he, you know, eventually became a priest, but he was a scientist first. See, 
This critic doesn't take issue with that, more so that the Vatican is hiding a tool that could be used to help solve, you know, unanswered crimes around the world and maybe help people. Like imagine how many killings could be solved and how many families of lost people could have answers. Stop being selfish. In first place, we have the allegations from Arise Church. So an external review of Arise Church has called for its entire board to resign after reports from more than 500 current and former members, you know, that include allegations of cult-like behavior, racism, essay, and conversion therapy came to light. So that report, compiled by a group called Pathfinding, which is, you know, a consultancy firm for charitable organizations, was leaked to journalist David Ferrier, who revealed pretty damning allegations. The report was filled with experiences of, like I said, so many people involved with the church, which received nearly 15 million in donations the year before it was released. A 34-page summary of the investigation concluded it was undeniable that there had been significant hurts caused to people involved with a rise and egregious and systemic failure in governance over many years. And, uh, yeah, call for the board members to get the heck out. Arise Church senior pastor John Cameron did resign from his role following all these allegations, and Brent Cameron, pastor and brother of John, also resigned from his position around the same time. In a statement on its website, Arise said it was committed to safely share the stories of those who had participated and the report had been illegally obtained. Sure, whatever you say. The Pathfinding Report recommended a full independent review of the church's finances, including, you know, how donations tagged for certain purposes are used in reality, and a review of policies around expenditure limits for senior leadership. It also recommended disallowing tithing by younglings, and for those who are unaware, it means giving a percentage of your earnings. There was pressure to donate money, and some felt pretty uncomfortable about comments made about their donations. And oh no, ah. Uh, I wish I could swear right now. Underage people should not have to give a percentage of their earnings to anything if they're working. In total, 545 people completed submissions for the review, including folks from every campus across the country, past and present ministry school students, current and former members, staff, and past board members. They revealed harmful practices that had continued up until present day, and a very significant number of people had experiences that caused pain and hurt. A review found racist remarks were said from those preaching on the stage, with some staff being told to focus on white kids. When troubling behavior was experienced by members, they felt unable to speak up due to the pressure to say yes and please senior leaders amid an honor culture that had a strong focus on leadership rather than Jesus. This culture created favoritism among members, and uh, leaders sometimes used derogatory nicknames over a period of months for some individuals. So the reviewers heard from people who were pressured to continue working despite illness or serious injuries, including broken bones and concussions, and the dangers people faced driving through the night on no sleep to meet expectations, and operating heavy machinery after 17 hours of duty. Review Viewers heard reports of people at the church who were part of the LGBTQI community being subjected to conversion therapy and denied opportunities to serve because of their sin. And when I tell y'all I almost burst into tears when I first read that, as an openly bisexual woman, in today's day and age, I just want to scream whenever someone claims sexuality other than heteronormativity is an abomination or a choice that could be changed. People are born this way and that's their lives. Let them be. It's not going to hurt your existence. Arise Church has reported a loss of almost 2.8 million and after all of the above came out last year, I couldn't be happier. The average number of people people at physical Sunday services fell from 4,000 people to under 3,000, and virtual services were attended by an average of 700 people, down from over 1,000. Numbers also fell across the church's programs for children, which went down, you know, 28%, and uh, young people, which was down 62%. Good riddance. Number five, St. Mary the Virgin Church. Clop Hill, England. I gotta say, that sounds like it's a fake place, like where Sir Topham Hat lives. Well, not only is it real, but it's home to a bone-chilling haunted church, St. Mary the Virgin Church. Now, St. Mary was built in 1350 outside the main settlement of totally real place Clop Hill. Traditionally, churches are built facing the east. I didn't know that. It's so it can align with the sun rising, which in Christianity is associated with heaven and the Messiah. Churches have their altars facing east so you pray in that holy direction. Well, St. Mary's just had to be a little different and this church is facing the west, facing away from God. And it's why some people believe the church is hosted to evil spirits, as facing west means they've shunned God and opened their doors to the devil. Paranormal investigators have strongly suspected the church as being host to satanic rituals. As the church fell into disuse, it became a popular spot for vandals, and if you believe the legends, black magic. In 1963, a local couple saw two people wandering around holding a human skull, which definitely I think would cause you to look twice. The people told the couple that they had found the skull in St. Mary's, where it had been jammed into a wall. When the couple went to investigate, they found on the floor a breastbone, pelvis, and leg bones, all laid out in a pattern used for black mass. Pretty spooky. Scattered cockerel feathers and tracings of two crosses filled in red were found inside the church as well. 
And as if that wasn't slightly unnerving enough, they also found that six graves of women in particular had been tampered with as well. All signs seemed to be pointing towards some dark rituals happening at St. Mary's Church. Common sightings at the St. Mary's Church range from smaller scale things like strange screeching during the night or hearing the bell going off despite being long abandoned, and the more threatening reports seeing tall dark figures wandering the ruins of the church, perhaps getting themselves ready for another ritual, or perhaps they've been contacted by a ritual and are arriving. Only thing I know is I won't be checking out the Midnight Mass there anytime soon. And if you're interested in way more scary stories of all manners, cryptids, conspiracies, churches, hauntings, aliens, we've got a little bit of everything at Top 5 Scary. So click on through, find something to get cozy with and subscribe and make sure you hit that bell so you catch all of our videos as they drop. But do all that stuff at the end of this one, okay? Because we got way more haunted churches for you coming right up. Number four. Our next entry on the list today is going to be the Aquia Episcopal Church. And if you haven't said that, try saying that 10 times fast. I dare you. Located in picturesque Stafford, Virginia. The church has 200 years of history to it, which means it's also got approximately 200 years worth of ghost stories to study. When the church was first built way back when in the 18th century, it was stained by an unfortunate tragedy. You see, the surrounding areas were exhausted by war and the lack of resources food and money, and as such, brigands would take to the dark country roads to attack innocents during the night for whatever they had on them. Well, one young woman was hiding from a gang of highwaymen and marauders and sought out the church as a safe haven. Unfortunately, the bandits eventually caught up with her and she met an untimely end. Now, These men were never caught for their crime and her body was not found for hundreds of years, left there to rot and decompose. And many believe that because of this, her spirit is tied to the church. And there have been several reports of hauntings ever since the discovery of those accursed bones. Visitors mention hearing footsteps frantically scattered around at night. These footsteps break into a run, but if you go searching, you'll never be able to find anyone attached to them. Voices can be heard in the room where she was attacked, some saying it sounds like a call for help or a painful scream of a struggle. Some go so far as to say they saw a transparent apparition of the woman in the church's windows or on the balcony. One story comes to us from a custodian who worked the graveyard shift there in the 1990s, claiming that he saw a ghostly woman's face floating above the graces and says that he saw her smiling at him through the balcony windows before she vanished. One last one on this church. In the 1990s, to celebrate the bicentennial anniversary, the church sent out an invitation to a group of Civil War reenactors to fight a mock battle on its ground. During the night, one of the reenactors was complaining that there was a red and orange light that was flickering the entire night during the church that prevented him from sleeping. The man explained this to the father of the church, and the father explained back that there was no electricity in the vestry, and that the light must have been the spirit confused by why the Civil War had started up again. Imagine, you're a ghost, you're already out of time. Time, and then you look outside and you see guys from your time, my little ghostly sense of the world would be so thrown off. I would have to buy a new ghost calendar. <laughs> Number three, Minister Nagayal the Duff or Abbey of the Black Hag if you don't got all that time. Wow, you see that? You see what that church is called in that little Chiron below me right now? I'm just supposed to pronounce that with like my lips? Okay, it's also called the Abbey of the Black Hag and that's what we're going with. We're not calling it that other thing. I'm not doing that. Black Abbey of the Hague, only name this church has ever gone by, and it was built in 1298. And it was one of the well-known medieval convents in Old Ireland. The remains of the abbey still stand today in a secluded valley, making an already mysterious and supernatural place just that much more supernatural and overgrown and spooky. I mean, the place is called the Abbey of the Black Hag. You don't name a place that unless it's extremely haunted or if there's like a cool boss fight or something there. Sounds like it's straight out of Dishonored. It's believed that the last abbess, horrible word by the way, in charge of the abbey practiced witchcraft and in the scary way, okay? She brought death, misfortune to the surrounding areas. Pope Martin V condemned the abbey, not being down for witches at all. The accused witch left to live out in the damp, deserted abbey by herself, which she probably loved because it sounds scary. Over time, her skin blackened, her hair furled, and her soul twisted, leading to the place being renamed the Abbey of the Black Hag. And if you can believe it, there's actually more to this one. The Count and Countess of Desmond once called the Abbey home when attempting to flee their attackers, where the Countess was fatally struck by an arrow and buried by her husband. But it wouldn't be the end of the Countess because sightings of a ghostly figure around the room ruins of the abbey were common, meaning someone eventually went to dig up that grave, finding worn out finger bones, meaning she was still alive when she was buried. 
It's said now that a woman's panic shrieking can be heard in the early hours around the Abbey. Number 2. The Borley Rectory The Borley Rectory is an old London estate that has the unique distinction of being considered the most haunted building in the United Kingdom. No big deal, or anything. <laughs> Almost immediately after its construction, stories of hauntings started to creep out. One of the first local legends says that in the 12th century, a priest and a nun had a naughty little affair, and when they were discovered, the nun was bricked up and left to rot in the nearby church. Since then, they say that her spirit roams the rectory. In 1900, four daughters of the then estate owner all said that they saw a nun wandering around the estate late at night. They tried to talk to her, but got no response back, just a scary ghost stare. The family claimed they had seen this nun around the property, and on one occasion they thought they saw the spectral apparition of a horse-drawn carriage with a headless rider. Some real sleepy hollow stuff. From there on, there was all these reports of bizarre sounds or strange shadows creeping out the corner of your eye. In 1927, the estate changed hands as the original family owning the estate had all passed on and a new family, the Smiths, had moved in. Shortly after, they discovered a human skull in the cupboard in a brown bag. Uh, which is not a great housewarming gift, to be honest. They reported poltergeist behavior, unexplained footsteps, lights flicking around them, and the same sightings of headless specters. Now, they only lasted two years, not being down for any of the hauntings or skulls and cupboards, any of that business. And the next family, the Foisters, didn't have much better luck. They had objects flying around their home, and on one occasion claimed their daughter was attacked by something truly horrible. They moved out as well. And the last owner of the rectory would be Captain Gray. Gregson, who accidentally lit the estate ablaze while unpacking, although insurance claims they think the fire was started intentionally, perhaps in a desperate attempt to cast away whatever evil has been trapped in the Borley Rectory for so long. Or perhaps he unintentionally unleashed it out into the world. Time will tell. And number one, Mortimer Abbey. Mortimer Abbey is a monastery in the forest of Lyons, France. A real old church built in 1134 on marshland near the stagnant water of the drainage lake. The monks dug it out to try and dry the marshy land around the Fulbrock stream, which was called the Dead Pond. In French, Melt Mall, which is where the name comes from. You can kind of hear it there. More mouth, Mortimer, you know. Perhaps it's this history of being built on a dead pond is why Mortimer Abbey was doomed to be haunted. Now, the Abbey flourished for centuries, but over time started to become claimed by the passage of time, and it fell into decline and disrepair. In the 17th century, there was an attempt to try and rebuild the Abbey and recapture its former old glory, but the decline was already pretty present and it set in by that point, and by the time of the French Revolution, only five monks still remained in the Abbey. Eventually, the Abbey would collapse entirely and go private, and in 1863, the Abbey would find itself in the hands of a rich Parisian family, the Delarues. Mr. Delarue moved his wife and his sons into the Abbey, but soon discovered they weren't the only tenants. While walking the lawns, the young people of the house saw a light from the library. As if by an invisible hand, these hatches unfastened, their handles turned, and the windows and doors all opened. The paintings on the inside side of the abbey turned themselves around and steps thundered out into the halls and nobody moved out immediately after. I would have started looking for new real estate right then and there. But one night the young Delarue, Charles, had his fiance over to come see the estate that would become her new home in marriage. She was offered the guest room but found herself terrified during the night when she couldn't sleep because she was too busy being tormented by mysterious sounds and objects around the room that were hurling themselves around being possessed by something. Having had, quite frankly, enough like I think any of us might have, the young suitor announced she would never live in this house, called off the entire marriage, and hurried back to Paris tout de suite, where there were plenty of handsome young men asking her hand in marriage who didn't live in old haunted estates, okay? That's the message to take away from this. Get the love you deserve, and the love you deserve is not in a haunted house. Number five, Oliver Plunkett's head. Now, in the other two videos, we talked about the head of St. Catherine of Siena, and we also talked about St. John the Baptist and how many heads he may or may not have had scattered across the world. And I'm not one to break tradition, so I thought for part three I would include a third holy, saintly, severed head, this time belonging to Oliver Plunkett. A notable difference between the two other severed heads is that this one is probably the most disgusting one we've included on these lists. I know these are all holy relics, but let me just say, out of context, this is absolutely horrifying and looks like it's straight out of a grindhouse horror movie that you'd find in a, a dirty basket somewhere. 
<laughs> Oliver Plunkett, before becoming a head, was an Irish Catholic Archbishop who was a victim of the Popish plot. Now, if you're not up to date on your Catholicism, that's a whole other video worth of explaining. I don't know much about the Popish plot. I'm not the guy to do that for you. But the short version is that it was a conspiracy falsely alleging that there was a plot against the Protestant King Charles II. Oliver Plunkett happened to end up on the receiving end of something really bad. Uh, namely, he was executed, which is pretty bad. But they really went out of their way to destroy Oliver Plunkett, his public image, his body. They called his praising of the Roman Catholic Church high treason. And his punishment was a slow and arduous death. He was hung, drawn, and finally quartered. Uh, and just in case there were any odds of him pulling through on a miraculous recovery, as a final author, they yeeted his head into a fire where it was rescued by a friend of Plunkett. I'd like to think I would do that for my friends. Well, after being recovered, the head was rescued and stored hidden away in a nunnery, eventually brought to Ireland in 1995, where he's now kept on display in the National Shrine to the Saint. He was canonized for his troubles, and he is the first new Irish saint in about 700 years. It's high time for some new blood, I think. So. You can go, you can pay your respects to him, and maybe offer him some skin cream, because uh, that skin's looking a little dry. And if you're looking for more creepy videos on weird relics or all sorts of strange things, Tap 5 Scary has all of that and then some. If there's something scary, the odds are pretty good we've got a video or two on it. And if you haven't already, subscribe, hit that bell for more videos every single day, but do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more weird Catholic relics coming up for you. Number four, St. Teresa's Hand. Now, if you've watched our other videos on this subject, then no doubt you're already very familiar with the practice of making remnants of saints into relics. Now, something that's directly from a saint is called a first class relic. That means it's something that came off of their body, you know? Uh, their hair, their fingernails, a vial of their fluids, or in the case of the lovely Saint Teresa, her whole hand. Encased in a beautiful ornate golden reliquary with gems all over the knuckles and the editors are goofing off because that's just a picture of the Infinity Gauntlet from Avengers Endgame. Wait, that, that's the real, that's what it really looks like. Yeah, it seems that Marvel Studios was more than inspired by the incorruptible St. Teresa's hand when designing the weapon that would give Thanos the power to wipe out half the universe. Throw a comparison pic of them side by side, they're almost indistinguishable. I'm not 100% certain if there's any symbolism or connection there, but I'm sure St. Teresa would love to know she was involved. She was a huge fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and all the things they do. When St. Teresa of Avila passed away, the sisters of her convent buried her with the hopes of keeping her holy body with them. Nine months later, she was exhumed, only to discover that her body was intact. She hadn't decayed at all. That's why they thought she was incorruptible. Now, I'm not sure I totally follow the logic here, but after they discovered her body was incorruptible, they uh, took her hand off and put it into this golden infinity gauntlet thing as a way of inviting people to get closer to God through the saint's body. Now, this might not seem appealing to you, but there's a surprising demand for this relic. Near the end of the Spanish Civil War, General Francisco Franco had the hand removed from the convent and allegedly kept it close by, and if some of the wilder rumors are true, he would keep it by his pillow for good luck. You really gotta hand it to him. He was a devout follower of the faith. Today, you can find the hand in Iglesia de Nuestra Señora de la Merced in Ronda, Andalusia, and you don't even have to rip a stone out of the vision's forehead to get a good look at this gauntlet. Number three, the Veil of Veronica. Now, on these lists of holy relics, we've had all sorts of strange things. We've had fingernails, teeth, dried up hands. We got milk coming up later. All things that have come from the body. Well, this next one is no different. It's the Veil of Veronica. And to put it gently, it's a sweat rag that's a few thousand years old. Probably one of the most pungent odors on the planet. Imagine every gym locker room you've ever been in times a thousand. When Jesus carried the cross, bruised and beaten, there was one person among the crowds who saw fit to help him out a little. Veronica wiped Jesus' face with this rag, and miraculously his face transferred onto the rag like it was silly putty on the funny papers. Now as an outsider, I thought this is what the Shroud of Turin was. That was the wrapping used to wrap Jesus after his death, so the thing I'm learning is that Jesus left an imprint of his face on just about any surface he touched. You give him a hug, have his face on the shoulder of your shirt for the rest of your life as a sacred artifact. Now, the Veil of Veronica is hard to nail down hard, concrete facts on. It's never been officially canonized as a relic of the church, and is only alleged to exist. It's claimed to be owned at St. Peter's in Rome, although this particular relic is not on public display anywhere. Probably for the best, 
Honestly don't know if I want to see a 2,000 year old sweat stain, the ones underneath my shirts are bad enough. Now it might sound like I'm being disparaging, referring to this relic multiple times as a sweat rag or a sweat stain, but I would like to offer this. The Latin name for the veil is Sudarium. Sudarium literally translates to sweat cloth, so even the official churchly terminology for this relic acknowledges that it's just a stinky rag that has some sweat on it, but a holy stinky rag that has some sweat on it. Number two, Mother Mary's milk. We're gonna do our best to get through this, I promise. Mother's milk might be my favorite Red Hot Chili Peppers album. It's my favorite character on The Boys, and it might just be one of the oddest relics on a series of odd relics that's all the way to part three. Took a lot of restraint to not put this in the first two, but we're on part three, so here it is now. As incredibly odd as it may sound, the Virgin Mary's milk is considered a relic of the Catholic Church. I, I hope they They've been keeping that in the fridge, lest it spoils. Does, does holy milk spoil? Is everything I've said in this video profoundly heretical? There is a church called the Church of Milk Grotto built outside Bethlehem. The history goes that the Madonna and child had taken refuge in this cave, and while she was feeding, milk spilled outwards and blessed the stone of the cave, turning it completely white. Now the church serves as a popular shrine for women who are struggling with fertility, who hope that the lasting aura and presence of the Virgin Mary will bless them. There is a legend that goes with it. Saint Bernard, the saint, not the big dog that has his tongue hanging out, was devoted to the Mother Mary. And one day he was praying at a statue of the Madonna, and he asked it to give him some sign, some proof that she was a mother. I guess the statue has like an odd sense of humor because it sprayed milk onto Saint Bernard. Uh, depending on the variation of the story, either his eye or in his mouth, I saw a lot of, of really interesting paintings depicting this scene. And editors, I hope you're having so much fun trying to find photos for this one. I am so sorry. Truly, rest in peace your search history. In the Middle Ages, vials of the milk were sold and transported all over Europe. For what purpose, I could not tell you. These days, the Church of Milk Grotto sells a limestone powder made from the stone walls of the grotto, meant to be dissolved in a drink and consumed. Uh, kind of like crystal light, but it's holy milk. Probably heals all that ails, and it's a good source of calcium, perhaps. And number one, the holy prep use. This is gonna be the one that takes the channel down. You have no idea the restraint it's taken me to, to only be bringing this up now in part three of, of Strange Relics. This is probably the strangest relic of them all. We'll do our best to discuss this with reverence and also somehow figure out how to stay within content guidelines. Editors, best of luck. When Jesus was born, on his eighth day, uh, a small piece of his skin was removed in a traditional ritual performed on Jewish men when they're born. Okay, are you, are you sort of following along with what I'm saying here? This particular part of the body that I can't quite mention that was removed at birth was an immensely holy relic to the Catholic Church called the Holy Prepuce. Now the very bizarre part regarding the history of the Holy Prepuce isn't just that it exists at all, it's how much trouble one bit of skin would cause. You see, the prepuce first pops up in the year 800, when Charlemagne gave it to Pope Leo III on December 25th, making it one of the oddest Christmas gifts ever given in human history. From here, it stayed until 1527. Now, when Rome was sacked, a German soldier stole the prepuce and tried to keep it for himself until it was eventually recovered again and became the centerpiece of the village of Calcutta, where it was seen as the most exciting thing to happen in a while. It was like a celebrity showed up to the village. It was this great, big, important deal. They had a part of the body of the Savior. All manner of miracles are reported to have been the result of the Holy Prepuce. However, Several other churches, villages, priests, all claimed that they had the true holy prepuce, and any other ones you might have heard of out there were false. This problem became rampant, and in the early 1900s, the church wanted to wash their hands of the holy prepuce entirely and outright forbade any discussion of it in church matters. It was actually an excommunicable offense to so much as bring up the prepuce. Meaning this video is pure heresy. In 1983, the prepuce was stolen from the church in Calcutta. Where is it now? Where did it go? Absolutely no one knows. No one's fessed up. You know, if you took it, I think now's a good time to just admit you did it. But 
If they're ever looking for a plot line for a third National Treasure movie, I have an absolutely amazing idea for something Nicolas Cage could steal. Number five, Hans Schmidt. I think all of us, we want to be remembered for something amazing someday, right? That's only human. For walking on the moon, for writing the great American novel. Me? I want to be remembered for being a slightly above average YouTube host for spooky internet comment. Well, Hans Schmidt, a German priest, he certainly remembered and found himself a legacy when he became the only Roman Catholic priest in American history to face the death sentence. They, they probably didn't put that on his tombstone or anything though. They say that you can see the signs of darkness from a very early age. Schmidt had wanted to be a priest since an early age, funny enough, but he was also routinely caught killing animals and drinking the fluids that were inside and would apparently spend most of his youth at the slaughterhouse and also his Wikipedia page mentions that he had a collection of severed geese heads that he'd put in his pockets. So yeah, maybe no, there, there were some warning signs and red flags here that people really were not paying attention to. By age 25, Hans Schmidt was ordained to be a priest and served over mass for four years in Germany before relocating to Louisiana. Schmidt got himself involved in some wild crimes, doing some unspeakable things that the church covered up for him. Wasn't that nice of them? And they once again found him on the move and he was sent to Manhattan at St. Boniface Church. Here Schmidt would meet with the love of his life, Anna A. Muller. He became immediately obsessed with her, claiming that it was God's will he fall in love with her. Oh my God, ladies, don't you just hate it when a guy pulls the old, oh, it's God's will, it's God's will, <laughs> all the time, eh? He began an affair with her and he held a secret wedding, vowing to leave the cloth with her. When a Muller became pregnant, Schmidt knew he would be outed for disobeying the oath of priesthood. So. Being a reasonable thinking man of God, Schmidt's solution was to slit her throat and remove her limbs and throw it in the Hudson River and then went to mass the next day. Oh, no, that's actually not, not very priest-like at all. Schmidt was tried, convicted, and executed in Sing Sing Prison where, like I mentioned earlier, he remains the only American priest that's ever happened to. Although from what I've learned about the guy, I, I don't think anyone would complain too much that that happened. I don't know if this was a huge and if you're looking for way more stories of creepy crawlies, ghosts, goblins, conspiracies, and basically anything freaky under the sun and above it that you can think up, hit subscribe for Top 5 Scary and don't miss a single scream. Make sure you hit that little bell, but do it at the end of this video if you wouldn't mind. Number four, Gerald Robinson. Hey, a little f hypothetical question. If you're a priest, how much Satanism are you allowed to dabble in? Pro probably not much, right? They, they probably would prefer that that be like as, as zero as possible. Gerald Robinson was a Catholic priest, but was living a double life, practicing satanic rituals in secret with horrifying consequence. In the 1980s, Robinson was the chaplain at Mercy Hospital in Toledo, where he ministered over the terminally ill. The caretaker of the chapel there was a nun named Sister Margaret Ann Powell, a kindly old woman. Shockingly and horrifyingly, Paul was killed after being stabbed 31 times, with nine times in a deliberate shape of an inverted cross and a smear across her forehead symbolizing a mockery of last rites. Police suspected someone was trying to humiliate Paul in death. Father Robinson was questioned, but not charged. A clergyman took Father Robinson out of his questioning and the case would freeze for nearly 30 years. Reports on the case would disappear and police believed there was a conspiracy of a cover-up. It wasn't until late in 2003 when police received a letter from a woman using the name Survivor Doe, claiming that she had suffered under the hands of Father Robinson, who had been assaulting women and practicing satanic rituals up to and including human sacrifice. With these new lofty allegations, authorities reopened the case and upon searching Robinson's apartment, discovered a sword shaped letter opener that fit the wound in the nun's body like a key to a lock, according to prosecutors. What a what a charming turn of a phrase for a horrible thing. In 2006, Robinson was charged and hopefully Sister Paul was able to find some peace in the afterlife after such a mortifying ordeal. Number three, Father Daniel Petra Corgano. When you take the cloth, you get called on for all sorts of things, marriages, funeral rites, confessions, and in the extreme cases, 
exorcisms, where you're the last line of spiritual defense against a demonic spirit that has taken host of someone else's body. Of course, exorcisms don't always go the way that you would hope. You know, sometimes a little pea soup gets fired across the room. Sometimes the person you're exercising accidentally dies from your neglect. You know, anything can happen, really. Father Daniel Petra Corgano believed that a member of his flock, a nun in the convent, one sister Marcia Corici, became the unwilling host to a demon that had moved in and paid first and last for rent inside her soul. Now, she was experiencing classical symptoms of schizophrenia, but Corgano believed it to be demonic possession. Sister Kornici was bound at her ankles and wrists and given holy water to drink, which she threw up. I, I don't really blame her. I bet it probably tastes weird. Rather brutally after this, Sister Kornici was bound to a cross and was gagged with a wet cloth soaked in holy water, which we already know she doesn't like the taste of. From here, she was cruelly subjected to a round-the-clock exercising over the course of three days. I cannot even imagine how mentally and physically taxing that was. Now, she wasn't fed during this time, nor were any of her medical needs tended to. And I don't know how much you know about like medical stuff or, or the human body, but you need food to live. Sister Cornici would unsurprisingly pass away from complications suffered during the exorcism, leaving this earth a free soul, if for nothing else. Now, Father Corgano would undergo investigation for his involvement in Cornici's death. He insisted that he was simply following following God's plan and that he was trying to cure her the way God intended and her death was a, an unfortunate accident and, and not his intention. Well, sure, you didn't kill her, but you did tie her to a cross and not feed her for three days, so you, you definitely helped. I don't know how to tell you. In the end, though, Sister Cornici's death was officially ruled to be caused by an overdose of adrenaline injections when she was taken into the hospital. Ah, okay, well that clears it up then. T total accident. Number two, the wild and wacky life of Pope Benedict the Ninth. Over the years, there have been many controversial popes. In fact, I would bet you can probably find more popes wrapped in controversy than not. While it's kind of pointless to compare sins on a sort of moral scale, it's hard to argue that few popes got up to even half as much chaos and trouble as Pope Benedict the Ninth. So notorious, he once sold the position when he got bored of it. He was just done. He sold it. It said he began his pontification when he was a young, young man because his family wanted it. They just wanted it. They wanted him to be Pope. Benedict loved the lifestyle and behaved the way Joffrey Baratheon would, spending his money on women of the night, hosting lecherous, wild, erotic parties with all manner of man, woman, and apparently animals as well. He really was not picky. It wasn't long before there were conspiracies being drawn up to assassinate the Pope, if you can believe that. Imagine that. There were guys sitting around a table being like, hey, we gotta do something about the Pope. I think we have to assassinate him. Possibly in a case of divine intervention, his enemies on a feast day snuck into St. Peter's Basilica carrying rope ready to strangle Benedict, but a solar eclipse of the sun scared the assassins so badly they called the whole plan off. And fair, if I was planning to dispose of the Pope and then like five minutes beforehand I saw the sun get blackened out, I would assume God was going to strike me down then and there. Failed coups notwithstanding, Pope Benedict's reputation did not improve much. He was attacked by an angry mob in 1045, forced to flee, and replaced by another pope, one Sylvester III. Two months later, though, Benedict would return to reclaim the title. And then two months again, he decided that honestly he wasn't really vibing with this pope business anymore, what with the constant bombardment uh, and attempts on his life, and sold it to his godfather for what amounted to nearly 30 million American dollars. Imagine buying the Pope. <laughs> Imagine the highest seat you can have in the Catholic Church and you bought it. <laughs> if you can believe it, like Emperor Palpatine, somehow Pope Benedict returned. They just could not get rid of this guy. King Henry III of Germany had arrested Pope Sylvester for being a false pope, and the godfather Benedict sold the throne to had given up the seat, admitting that it was wrong for him to buy being the pope. It was wrong to buy the papacy. I, uh, I could have told you that. Henry appointed a new German pope while Benedict was in hiding, and then that pope passed away mysteriously eight months later after being poisoned, which many historians suspect Benedict had his little fingers in. So Benedict came back to be a pope for a third time 
and no one was putting up with this. <laughs> Henry III sent troops to drag him out of the basilica, and he spent his dying years in a monastery where he is now remembered as one of the worst popes in history. But he sounds fun. <laughs> Number 1. Oliver O'Grady All of these people have been awful or downright embarrassing examples of priests, and yet Oliver O'Grady might be the worst of all of them. YouTube Content Guidelines really does not like for us to be discussing the kind of crimes that he committed, but I will say this. If I say a Catholic priest committed a crime, it's the first one that you're imagining right now. It's that one. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you might not be old enough to watch these videos. O'Grady began his career in the early 70s and committed innumerable, immoral, irredeemable acts on the most vulnerable members of his flock. By 1993, he was convicted and sentenced to a 14-year prison sentence and a $7 million settlement to the victims whose families and lives he'd ruined. However, and if, if you don't want your day ruined, pause this video, open up another tab, go watch a video of some like kittens playing or anything. Nothing good is about to happen here. He only served half that sentence. He served seven years and was then paroled and deported in Ireland. In 2005, a video deposition had O'Grady confessing to having had 25 victims. In 2006, a documentary made about Oliver O'Grady called Deliver Us From Evil focused on his crimes, but more importantly, how the Catholic Church pulled a nice big white rug over the horrific crimes he committed to protect their clergy. The documentary outlines how O'Grady preyed on his victims, how he committed his crimes, and how the church was very well aware of everything he was doing and swept it under the rug. In 2019, O'Grady was arrested again. Oh, I can't believe it. He seemed like such a good guy. This time for owning deeply illegal lewd content. O'Grady would find himself in jail again in 2020, sentenced to 22 months, which seems kind of like a slap on the wrist given the history, but what do I know? Generally, I think if they make documentaries about the crimes that you've committed, that should impact the sentence slightly. But again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a YouTube host, and I'm just Tay. Number 5. A close personal working relationship with Benito Mussolini The Vatican isn't just the seat of the Catholic Church, it's also the smallest country in the world. Did you know that? Despite existing inside of Italy, the Vatican isn't part of Italy, but rather its own country, a little sovereign state. About a thousand people live there total. But it hasn't always been that way though, it wasn't founded as its own separate city. And the reason it became that way is a little darker than I'm sure the church would like to admit to, a treaty with infamous fascist leader Benito Mussolini. In 1922, Mussolini and the National Fascist Party came to power, crushing democracy and putting up a pretty hostile dictatorship in its place. In 1929, Mussolini and the church came together to meet and sign a treaty, granting the church the status as a private enclave, a sovereign state inside of Italy. The deal was, Mussolini wouldn't bother the Vatican, and they wouldn't bother him. Mussolini even paid out a massive, massive settlement which the church invested and is believed to have been valued at $780 million. Alongside the church getting tax exemption status and priests getting a healthy salary from the Italian government. All of those benefits you can thank fascist leader Benito Mussolini for. Perhaps most illuminating, however, was a clause that protected the Vatican's dignity, so to speak. Meaning as part of their laws as a sovereign state, they were allowed to arrest and try anyone who criticized the people and the church. In exchange for signing this treaty, the Catholic Church publicly supported the fascist dictatorship and was recognized as Italy's official government. The Vatican's own newspaper printed shortly after the deal went down, Italy has been given back to God and God to Italy. And they had the support of someone who was involved in hundreds of thousands of deaths to thank. Isn't that fun? And if you're looking for way more church conspiracies, old secrets, relics, all kinds of things, ghouls, goblins, aliens galore, top five scary, has all of that and then some. Really, we'll do just about anything on this channel. I'm talking about the church right now. So hit subscribe, make sure you ring that little bell as well so you don't miss a single scream, but you do that at the end of this video, okay? Because I got four more church scandals coming up for you right now. Number four, the banquet of chestnuts. Believe it or not, this might shock you, more than a few popes have been less than pious. You know, we'll go deeper later in the list, but several, several popes would be on the naughty list. Among them, Alexander VI, 
who you might know better as Rodrigo Borgia. Rodrigo was said to have some pretty bizarre hobbies, even by papal standards. He apparently loved to watch horses mate. That was apparently one of his favorite ways to spend an afternoon. Once or twice, sure, you know, we all get curious, Rodrigo, but, but frequently, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. Maybe you have to be there. Anyway. That's not even the most controversial thing the Borgias were involved in. Seriously, look up the Borgias after this video, there was a lot. One of the most infamous things Rodrigo got involved in was called the Banquet of Chestnuts, sometimes referred to a little more colloquially as the Joust of... I don't really think I can say this and stay in the family friendly guidelines. The Joust of Women of the Night, if you know what I mean. Are you, are you following? It's a word that they say in Game of Thrones a lot. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, maybe you're not old enough to be watching this channel. The joust that shall not be named wasn't quite a literal joust, although there was a great deal of thrusting and charging. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cesare Borgia, real life Jamie Lannister and one time Assassin's Creed Brotherhood villain, arranged a banquet in his chambers in the Vatican with 50 of the hardest working courtesans of the time. They danced after dinner, then disrobed, and then the joust began. Rodrigo and his family gleefully threw chestnuts on the floor, forcing the women to grovel around their feet like swine. They offered prizes, clothes, jewelry, all sorts of baubles for the man who could fornicate with the most courtesans, which is, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> that's a pretty interesting event for the Pope to preside over. Think about the next time you're at an official church event in your community, like a, like a bake sale or something. Just think about the other events the head of the Catholic Church and the voice that speaks to God was holding and participating in. Number three, killing Joan of Arc over pants. Joan of Arc is a very familiar name to Catholics and, well, just about everybody. She's a pretty famous historical figure. You probably know her famously as a saint. You might recognize her as a force for feminism. I think she was in one of the Bill and Ted movies. Well, her status as a saint came a long time after some trouble she was embroiled in with the church, who at one time saw her as an enemy to their very ideals, going so far as to consider her their number one enemy. In 1429, the young Joan of Arc believed that God had spoken out to her and helped instigate an uprising to get the English out of France. Very cool for the French people who wanted them gone, but some high-ranking influential members of the clergy who had ties to the English weren't terribly fond of this wild woman who was going around dressing like a man and claiming that God speak to her and was kicking all of their friends out of the country. Somebody do something about this wild woman. When King Charles VII enjoyed Joan's help during the many battles against the English. When Joan was captured by English forces, she learned the true extent of his loyalty when he handed her over to the Catholic Church to stand trial for heresy. After all, she was claiming she talked to God, and only the Pope is supposed to do that. And worst of all, Joan of Arc was wearing pants. She was wearing pants while doing it like a man. So Joan was put on trial for heresy and denied counsel, which is against her rights. Saul Goodman would have been furious. Regardless, Joan kept her cool, rather famously, and is, is famed for her level head. Joan was found guilty of being a rebellious spirit who wore men's clothes, and for these indignations was burned alive at the stake in front of a cheering crowd. In 1456, some 25 years after her horrific death, King Charles VII felt kind of bad about that whole ordeal ordered an investigation and made her a martyr. It wasn't until 1920 that she was officially canonized as a saint. Think of it like a like a heavenly apology. Uh, I'm sure the water's fine, I'm sure the air is cool, no bad blood between Joan and the Catholic Church. I bet she's having a great time. I'm sure she appreciated it. Number two, buying redemption. Can man find redemption? Can the weight of our sins be undone? Can a person truly change his course? Can an evil man become good? These lofty questions have dominated the hearts of man for years, inspiring countless great works of art and philosophical conundrum. At religion's heart is the concept of salvation and redemption. So it might strike you as more than a little bit bizarre that at one point in time, the Catholic Church was selling absolution for a price tag. Now before we get into that, we need to talk quickly about an indulgence. No, not eating an extra large cheese pizza by yourself, but that is an indulgence of sorts. 
If you're like me and you've skipped Sunday Mass for the last 26 years, basically an indulgence in Catholic terms is sort of like a plan or a plea for absolving your sins. Something you have to do to absolve yourself. Uh, 30 Hail Marys, con confession, that sort of stuff. In the early 15th century, after Pope Julius died, Pope Leo X would inherit the papacy. Leo loved the pleasures that came with being Pope. He loved the big hat. He loved spending lavishly. He loved voluptuous entertainment. He loved living like a king not a pope. It took him eight years to completely drain the Vatican's treasury, which other popes weren't really doing. So when St. Peter's Basilica was in the process of being rebuilt, they were plain out of money and needed a fundraiser. But instead of selling Girl Guide cookies door to door, Leo announced that anyone who contributed money to the church would be granted an indulgence. Now, an indulgence was supposed to be a path laid out by a church for your betterment, but it was hawked as if you were buying a sin redemption ticket, like a get out of hell free card. Dominican friar John Testel was named the Grand Commissioner of Indulgences in Germany. Seeing overseeing indulgences was his only job. That's the only thing this guy did to give you a sense of how many people were doing this. He sold absolution for future sins you were planning to commit later. Pay a small fee, and if you kill a guy next week, totally fine, God says it's okay. Now this probably worked pretty decent if you had a bit of coin, but if you were an average person, a serf like me, perhaps, uh, you did your best to prepare for an eternity in hell. Salvation was just another pleasure the rich had, and hell is where us poors go. Unsurprisingly, Someone got very upset about this new stance from the church. He was pretty upset about this. His name was Martin Luther, and he passive-aggressively left a note on some doors like an upset roommate, and I, I can't remember if anything ever came out of that, if anything ever happened to him in history. It's, it's lost to time. It's probably unimportant. Number one, the plot of Assassin's Creed 2 was real. <laughs> If you've garnered anything from this video, I sincerely hope it's that the Pope oftentimes does not follow the rules. Yes, the guy interprets the will of God, and he's got a direct phone line to him directly, but that doesn't mean he has to follow every single one of his rules. We've already discussed some truly wild sins, horse mating, chestnut parties, spending money, but let's top it all off with the biggest one, a full-blown assassination conspiracy revolving around a Pope ordering a hitman. And you just... Sit on that for a second. In the 1470s, Pope Sixtus IV hashed a scheme to get Flo to rid Florence of the Medicis, who was the most influential family in the country at the time, with such power that they rivaled the church. The Medicis had served as the bankers for the papacy for generations, and as such were absurdly wealthy. Pope Sixtus kickstarted this conflict when he swapped the Medicis as the papal bankers to the Pazzi family. Oh, no, 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 no. The Medicis didn't want to fund the Pope's uh, claim of the town of Imola, which the Medicis wanted to claim for themselves to lord over. So, something had to be done about these meddling Medicis. Pope Sixtus contracted two assassins to carry out the plot against Lorenzo and Giuliano de' Medici during Easter Mass on a Sunday which just feels unbelievably disrespectful to me. If you're the Pope, I mean, ordering an assassin against anybody, morally gray, but doing it on Easter Mass? You're not even allowed to talk in church, but you can orchestrate a political assassin? I don't know. Now, if you're sitting listening to this and you're kind of wondering why some of this sounds vaguely familiar and you don't know why you recognize these names, it's because you might recognize this plotline in between jumping into Bales of Hay as being a major force in Assassin's Creed 2, where protagonist Ezio Aritore da Frienze ends up helping out Lorenzo Medici a great deal. Yes! The games were really inspired by true history, save for a few extendo blades and boss fights against the Pope. Uh, Rodrigo Borgia, as far as we know, never got into a fist fight with any assassins and wasn't killed by Cesare, but I digress. If you remember from Assassin's Creed 2, Giuliano was fatally slain, but Lorenzo survived and rallied support of Florence in a war against the church. Lorenzo picked off conspirators, sorry, Ezio picked off conspirators, and then sailed to Naples to meet King Ferdinand to discuss a peaceful solution to the bubbling war. So in the end, the plot failed drastically because all it really did was make people think that Lorenzo Medici was the coolest guy around and brought intense shame to Pope Sixtus and it inspired one of the best games Ubisoft ever made. In fifth place, we have an exorcism filmed through a peephole. So it's no secret that exorcisms are still 
still a practice done today, but the Catholic Church really likes pretending that they don't because of the negativity around it. Technically speaking, the Catholic Church authorizes the use of exorcism for those who are believed to be the victims of demonic possession. Specifically, in Roman Catholicism, which is what I grew up with, exorcism is a sacramental but not a sacrament, so unlike baptism, confirmation, first communion, or confession. Unlike a sacrament, exorcisms depend on two elements, authorization from valid and legitimate church authorities, and the faith of the exorcist. The church will ask publicly and authoritatively in the name of Jesus Christ that a person or object be protected against the power of the evil one and withdrawn from his dominion. Now, the rite of exorcism was revised in January of 1999, making it a lot less Latin, and assumes that, you know, possessed persons retain their free will, although the demon may hold control over their physical body and involves prayers, blessings, and invocations with the use of the document of exorcisms and certain supplications. Typically, the individual will be restrained and the priest will perform a ritual of prayers to um, remove the evil spirits. Solemn exorcisms, according to the canon law of the church, can be exercised only by an ordained priest or higher, with the express permission of the local bishop, and only after a careful medical examination to exclude the possibility of mental illness. The Catholic Church has between five to 600 official exorcists, with the vast majority operating in Latin America and Eastern Europe. Now that we're all clear on the formal definition of exorcisms, time to dive into this lovely 2014 video. The ritual was captured on camera by a man who heard the shrieks of the woman inside the sanctuary and filmed it through the uh, peephole of a door. The incident occurred at the Assumption of the Virgin Mary Church in Vranov, Najijai, in February of 2014. The church's priest, Marek Danda, confirmed the video is real, but only said that if something is filmed through a keyhole, there's nothing more to say about it. Which is a dodging the question kind of answer if I've ever heard one. He told the newspaper he was talking to that he carries a mandate from his bishop to perform exorcisms, and also said that the group were asking God to protect and to liberate the person, including using a Latin prayer asking for help, and you know, of course it helps. Pardon me. I'm no expert on exorcism rituals yet, yet. But uh, if you have to state that something of course helps, in my personal experience, it's a smidge sketchy. It's very hard to tell what is happening in the video, but it appears that at least two people surround the woman, who can be heard screaming in agony with momentary pauses in between for the duration of the, you know, just under two minute long video. Daniel Trocta, who, you know, shot the video after hearing the screams, warns people in the description to watch the chilling footage while wearing headphones, which is what I did. When asked about the condition of the woman in the video, the priest said any details about her or her state were private. And while I'm glad the church is respecting her privacy, I hope that the poor woman has been cured and healed. As much as I joke about it, demonic possession is no pleasant relationship laughing matter. In fourth place, we have footage from 2020. Okay, before anyone out there panics, I'm talking about the American news magazine that's been, you know, broadcasted on TV since June of 1978. Not the awful year in recent history that we're not going to talk about, because that was awful. On April 5th of 1991, the show featured a segment that showed an actual Roman Catholic ritual of casting out demons. Videotaped at a nun's home in suburban Palm Beach County, the segment shows the affected girl, referred to only as Gina, as she thrashes under the effect of ancient prayers, is sprinkled with holy water, and, you know, has a cross being pressed to her head. And stuff. The girl retches, writhes, yells, and bares her teeth. She says, Get out of here! Me not want to leave! Shrieking all this at the priest, as one hand snaps the gauze bonds tying her to the chair. By the way, apparently if the exorcism team hadn't tied her down, she might have levitated to the ceiling. How very Willy Wonka. At the time, the March 25th issue of US News and World Report carried no fewer than five articles on hell and the devil, setting a poll that six out of ten Americans believed in the netherworld, which is 2% more than in the church heyday of the 1950s. Another poll, released in August of the same year, said 55% of Americans believe in the devil and 49% uh, in demonic possession. I'd love to see those results today, but I couldn't find them sadly. Most Catholic leaders say possession is rare, with Reverend Kenneth Doyle, communications director for the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, stating he's only heard of about a handful of exorcisms in the last 40 years, but I feel like that's just a PR statement. Here's the thing. When churchmen do perform an exorcism, they almost never talk about it. The main exorcist in this entire report is known only as Father A, and his face is kind of obscure. Sister Lois Schaefer and the Reverend Walton Dockerill of St. Rita Parish near West Palm Beach, who took part in the exorcism, said through a secretary that, uh, no comment. Hmm. Palm Beach Bishop J. Keith Simons, who permitted the taping, issued only a four paragraph statement, saying that the devil really exists, he is powerful and actively at work in the world today, as through the centuries, which uh, echoes what Cardinal John O'Connor of New York said. Now, it was O'Connor's remark that there can be no question about the reality of the devil that initially drew the interest of 2020, especially after the church got about 75 requests from around the country to investigate possible cases of possession. That job fell to the Reverend James Labar, a specialist in the occult, who looked into some of the initial claims and decided that Gina in South Florida was genuinely being tormented by demons. According to the report, she experienced psychotic episodes, plus visions of demons and dead persons. Oh, I don't wish that on anybody. 
Her mother says she tried visits to a spiritist and to various hospitals, and in the footage, the priests say the girl is controlled by ten evil spirits. They meet her violent reactions by following the prayers and the gestures of the rite. The ordeal took about six hours, and um, this isn't really uncommon for exorcism lengths. Before the procedure even took place, Father A mentioned how it's a terrifying experience at times, and that he, you know, could die tomorrow or be attacked and taken over. Evil spirits like to take their time leaving a body, and not without a fight, and that leaves all the parties involved extremely drained and exhausted and vulnerable. Also quoted is Dr. Warren Schlanger of Miami Children's Hospital, where Gina was treated before and after the exorcism, and he did note that her condition improved afterwards. Father Ray, though, is still troubled. He believes the devil is disturbing his sleep, attempting to weaken and destroy him. He counts that as the price he must pay as a church point man against demons. Now, I know, someone's about to ask. But Alexa, didn't you say you'd be talking about hidden footage? The church tried taking this footage down from the internet because they didn't want it to be public anymore, but thankfully they haven't succeeded. In third place, we have the director of The Exorcist. Now, unlike the last two mentions, this footage is missing and locked up, never to be seen. The director of The Exorcist has mentioned in interviews that he was allowed to film a real exorcism at the Vatican, of all places. William Friedkin said he was taken aback at how close the ceremony was to the exorcism depicted in his 1973 film. He said that he doesn't think he will ever be the same after seeing this astonishing Thing. Now, he says he intended to shoot The Exorcist as a horror film, but the more he learned it, the more it became a supernatural tale instead. So while the book this was all based on a 1949 case of an American teenager called Roland, Friedkin said the Catholic Archdiocese of Washington DC asked him to change the gender so as to you know not draw attention to the young man. But in reality, the director said that it was a young man of 14 and not a gal who was allegedly possessed. Now, the Vatican did not immediately respond to a request for comment. And Still has not as of this day. The church asking someone to hide something and then not commenting on it. I'd say I'm shocked, but I made a promise to myself to never lie on here, and I'm not about to start doing that today. Freakin said he believed the boy was genuinely possessed, convinced that there was no other explanation. He read the diaries of not only the priests involved in the exorcism, but the doctors, the nurses, and the patients at Alexian Brothers Hospital in St. Louis, where this original case was carried out. He's also stated that he's not Catholic, doesn't go to church, or belong to a church or a synagogue. Make of that what you will. In second place, we have the exorcism of a satanic queen. This tale in particular comes from Dr. Richard Gallagher, who is an Ivy League educated, board certified psychiatrist, and who performed a mental health evaluation on our sad woman to make sure it wasn't, you know, an instance of something that could be helped with modern medicine first and foremost. He described her as a middle-aged woman who wore flowing dark clothes and black eyeshadow, and while she was charming and engaging, she was also part of a satanic cult. Um, this is where I swear I'm not part of a satanic cult, even though that visually fits my aesthetic. She called herself the queen of the cult, but Gallagher would refer to her as Julia, the pseudonym he gave her. The woman had approached her local priest and was convinced she was being attacked by a demon. The priest referred her to an exorcist who reached out to Gallagher for, you know, a mental health evaluation. It was one of the first cases he took, and apparently it changed him. So he helped assemble an exorcism team that met Julia in the chapel of a house. He was adamant that objects would fly off shelves around her, and she somehow knew personal details about him, such as how his mother had died of ovarian cancer, and that the two cats in his house went berserk fighting each other the night before one of her sessions. She even found a way to reach him even when she wasn't with him. One night he was talking on the phone with Julia's priest when he says both men heard one of the demonic voices that came from Julia during her trances even though she was nowhere near a phone and thousands of miles away. He and a team of exorcists paid her many visits, but eventually she called a halt to the sessions. She was too ambivalent and relished some of the abilities she displayed during her trances. About a year after she dropped out, Gallagher says that he heard Julia's voice on the phone again. This time though she had called to tell him that she was um, passing of cancer, and he offered to try and help her with you know, a team of priests while she was still physically able, but her response was vague, and sadly she passed before he was able to help further. Now while Gallagher has taped all footage of his work, he has been forbidden by the church to release any of it. Ergo, sorry folks, I got nothing. In first place we have Ed and Lorraine Warren exorcism footage. Me talking about Ed and Lorraine Warren? I know, a shocker. While the video is blurred on YouTube to protect the identity of the poor girl, I personally think it's up there as one of the most frightening things I've ever seen. At an hour and 20 minutes long, it depicts a Catholic bishop in Connecticut attempting to converse with a demonic entity that has possessed the body of an innocent young woman while her family restrains her. Ed and Lorraine were the ones to alert the church to the possession after meeting her during an audience chat session that was held at the conclusion of one of their public presentations. During portions of the exorcism when prayer is done, you can hear the demon acting wildly, and it originally refuses to give its name, both of which are quite common in cases of demonic possession. Eventually we learn that there are four demons possessing our victim, with one of them identifying themselves as Robert, a name associated with the son of Satan. I'll let a snippet roll now, allowing you to hear the woman for yourself. This footage was unreleased until after the passing of Ed and Lorraine, and it's believed that they were told by the Catholic Church to specifically keep it under wraps, but their son-in-law doesn't have the same fear or respect for the church, depending on one's opinion. Number 5. St. Catherine's 
Satan's head. Coming up first on our list of strange artifacts that the Catholic Church has hidden away is the severed mummified head of the revered Saint Catherine of Siena. You wouldn't really expect there to be a severed head kept out on display, but it is an important head I've come to understand. When she was young, Saint Catherine had a vision of Jesus on a throne surrounded by saints. Afterwards, she devoted her life to Catholicism and she gave herself to the nunnery, cut her hair, scalded herself, and took a vow of celibacy. At 28, Catherine was said to have received the stigmata when five red rays shot out of the crucifix she was praying to and pierced her hands, her feet, and her heart. But these were far from the only miracles attributed to the lovely Saint Catherine, however. She was said to be seen levitating once during prayer and even once a priest said he saw a holy communion fly from his hand directly into her mouth. Now I will be honest, that does make her sound a bit like a saintly golden retriever, but okay. Catherine would pass at the young age of 33 and would be canonized a century later. If you don't know, that's a fancy word for being made into a saint post-mortem. While she passed in Rome, there was some disagreement as to where the young saint should be laid to rest eternally. Her hometown of Siena quite wanted her body back. Her spiritual leader, Raymond of Capua, knew he wouldn't really be able to smuggle her entire body past guards in Rome, so he elected to just uh, take her head in a bag. Which normally would be terrifying behavior, but it's good here. The story goes that when the guards intercepted Raymond, he prayed to Catherine, and when they looked inside his sack, they found naught but a collection of rose petals and not a severed head. Her final miracle. Now the head was placed in a relic, a relic area, that's a difficult word to say, especially on a teleprompter. The head was placed in a relic area, where it still remains today, and you can go and pray to it, and I promise it's not gonna blink or anything at you, even though it looks like it just might. And if you're looking for way more stories of creepy relics locked away, haunted object, cursed things, cryptids, conspiracies, aliens, the whole scary nine yards, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. So hit that little bell, hit subscribe, and make sure you do not miss a single thing. Do it after this video, okay? We got way more creepy things locked away coming up for you right now. Number four, the Grand Grimoire. Our next entry has been formally referred to as the Gospel of Satan, and is said to be a cursed book whose knowledge had to be sealed away to protect humanity. So this might be the most deadly book ever published after Hop on Pop. The Grand Grimoire, who is said to have been penned by a priest in the 16th century, who was possessed by a litany of demons who compelled the man to put their knowledge to paper. Acting as a scribe for these demons, the man wrote everything they knew about dark incantations, spells, instructions on how to cast rituals, ways to bind a demon to you to make it your little minion and do your bidding? Wait, a demon gave instructions on how it wants to be bound to a human? To serve humans? Freaky little demon. That's not all too. There is a step-by-step -step recipe for a little necromancy if you're down to dabble in some dark arts and make some bones dance to your rhythm. The book really covers all the fun stuff you have been told not to do. It's not just brimstone and hellfire neither. There's rituals to help manipulate luck, how to conduct a seance, and I actually think this is adorable. There's even ways to make people love you in there. But dating tip from old Tay, uh, if you need a demon's help to make them like you, it might not be the strongest relationship. So, just a heads up. Now, if all of this is sounding super appealing, and I don't blame you, I played a necromancer in Skyrim, I want to make the bones raise, just know that this book is considered high treason. Even so much as cracking the spine is considered, is considered equivalent to selling your soul. So, you know, maybe hold off on that Amazon order for a bit. Also, I'm pretty sure the copy they're selling on Amazon is not the original, because due to the book's cursed reputation, the original copy is said to be locked away in the Vatican's secret archives, and I'm sorry, but no matter how many times you ask, they're not gonna let you look at it, even if you swear you're just taking a little peek just to look at the illustrations and maybe the dedications. They're gonna keep it locked up. I know. Number three, Hyacinth of Caesarea. Our next entry is the bones of Hyacinth of Caesarea, another Catholic mummy. I'm starting to think there's more Catholic mummies than there were Egyptian ones. Incredibly ornate and gorgeous, the bones of Hyacinth look like something out of one of the Indiana Jones sequels rather than like a real thing you can go and see, but I I promise you they are totally extant. On the grounds of the Furstenfeld Abbey reside the relics of two saints. Now these aren't just like a toenail or a tongue and more on that later, but these are full on science class skeletons dressed to the nine in gold and jewels, encrusted in more diamonds and rubies than you could imagine. They are probably worth more than your and my apartments combined. Old Hyacinth 
Pisces, as he liked to be called by his friends, was an obscure martyr from the early days of Christianity, slain by the Romans for his faith. We know precious little about him today, but we know that his name appears in a list of martyrs from the 4th century, which suggests that he used to be pretty important, and he was popular enough to write his name down on a list, much like what I'm doing right now. Look at how history repeats itself like that. Isn't that fascinating? Now, Hyacinth's skeleton showed up at the Church of the Assumption in, uh, I'm going to excuse the pronunciation here, Furstenfeldbruck near Munich at an unknown date. Did somebody just dropped him off? Somebody just dumped a bag of bones on the front step like he's a baby you're giving up for adoption at the fire station? No more questions. The church was sacked by the Swedish army in the 17th century, and when it was rebuilt, they really went all out out with the decor. Going over the top, a little baroque, including a skeleton decked out in bling, looking like he is about to take over the skeleton rap scene. So that's Hyacinth. Largely not remembered in life for any particular reason beyond being slain for his religion and remembered forever as a ludicrously swagged out skeleton. We can all only hope for similar legacies as dear sweet Hyacinth. Number 2. The Tongue of Saint Padilla Did you know your tongue is made up of 8 muscles? Maybe you didn't. Did you know that one of the most important relics to the Catholic Church is a dried up 8,000 year old tongue that looks like beef jerky kept inside a golden helmet that looks like something out of a dark fantasy 80s movie? Well now you do. And have you enjoyed how much of this list is mummified bodies in gold? Because I have. Saint Anthony was said to be a jewel case of the Bible, making a name for himself with his apparently extremely inspirational sermons that won the Catholic Church many new members. People would flock in just to hear what Saint Anthony was talking about. Apparently Apparently he even got a bunch of ex-Christians to reform and rejoin the faith. He was apparently an incredibly accomplished public speaker, and I would say that he had a silver tongue, but we actually have proof of what color his tongue was because it's kept in a little glass jar. Saint Anthony would pass away in 1231 from edema, a horrible disease that causes a buildup and blockage of fluid in the body's tissues. Now some 30 years later, in 1263, he was exhumed and shocking the gravediggers who were doing it. Well, while his body had rotted and decomposed, his legendary tongue was still intact, as incorruptible as it had been in life, allegedly still wet with saliva. I wonder if he could still taste. Seeing it was a miracle, the gravediggers took his tongue alongside the bottom half of his jaw, and they are both displayed in the Basilica of St. Anthony of Padua in elaborate gold reliquaries. But honestly, it looks like something straight out of Warhammer 40k. Does no one think this is as odd as I do? Maybe I'm an outsider, I didn't grow up terribly casual. Catholic, so I don't really know these imagery. I know the story behind it isn't terribly scary, but the image of this tongue and jaw inside a little glass helmet wrapped in gold looks like something I would ask an AI to make if I typed in nightmare. A tongue shouldn't look like that. <laughs> and I feel like a jaw shouldn't look like that either. Am I alone in this? Am I weird for thinking this is weird? You let me know down below in the comments if maybe I just lack context on all of this. And number one, Camilus de Lellis' heart. Camilus de Lellis was a man with a big heart, full of love, never ending in generosity. We know just how big his heart is because it is kept in a glass jar and it is salted to preserve its legacy. Whoa. Camilla started out pretty humble, born in 16th century Naples. He would later become a soldier until a brutal gambling problem would end up overtaking his life, leaving him in rags driving a donkey cart, but he knew that a far better life was out there. Eventually, he was urged by a friar to explore the lighter side of his soul, and eventually someone was able to pierce his heart both figuratively and later literally, and persuaded him into seeking divine retribution. Camillus would devote his life to providing for the ailing, but tragically and perhaps unsurprisingly if you spent all your time around sick people before modern medicine, a lifetime of caring for the sick led to him also becoming gravely ill, soaking up a litany of ailments, including a sore in his leg for 46 years, a rupture for 38 years, two callous sores in the sole of a foot, violent nephritic colics, intense kidney pain, and for a long time a loss of appetite. Now all of these things, working in tandem, would eventually claim Camillus, a man who gave his his life to healing the sick. So post-mortem he was canonized and thought of as the patron saint of the sick. And what better way, I ask, to venerate a man famous for his ever giving heart than to cut his heart out like he was in the temple of doom and start salting his heart like it was beef jerky. You can go to St. Mary Magdalene's church in Rome to go see if his heart, you know, put a stethoscope up to it, check if it's still beating, but it's pretty dried up and tucked away behind glass where you can go and pay your respects and see if it has any life left to bestow and maybe if it'll help you out with an illness at all. In fifth, we have the Most Holy Trinity Church in New York. 
built sometime between 1882 and 1885 on land that previously served as a graveyard until 1853. According to local rumors, not all of the bodies residing there were exhumed from the graveyard, and the spirits of those left behind still inhabit the grounds to this day. The church property covers an entire city block, and it is said that there are false closets leading to bricked up doorways, tunnels, and random sub-basements throughout the church and convent. There are also mysterious passageways on the upper levels of the church, where legend says only priests are able to enter. The church's rectory was built in 1872 by its second pastor, Monsignor Michael May, who later passed in his room on the second floor. Priests who live in the rectory have used that space for mainly a guest room ever since, as no one has ever been willing to live in it on an ongoing basis. Guests have experienced lights being switched off and on, hearing strange noises, and the sound of a person walking back and forth while trying to sleep. Phantom footsteps have also been heard on the staircases in the building, and dogs who were once kept as pets in the rectory would stare in a trance light stake down the basement stairs, as well as into the dining room when the building got cold. In 1897, a parish bell ringer named George Stell's life was taken in the vestibule of the church. Though there was a suspect in the case, a former parishioner who would later be executed for an unrelated ending of life, no one was ever convicted of the crime. The red fluids of Mr. Stell's, as well as the red handprint of the killer, is believed to still be on the wall in a stairway leading to the bell tower. George's ghost still roams the church and is believed to be the reason why the bells will ring suddenly, vowing not to leave until his death has been solved. Moving on to our fourth place position, we have the Aquia Church of Stafford, Virginia. While the congregation was established in 1711, the physical parish wasn't built until 1751. It was a gorgeous brick building built on a peaceful hilltop with a two-story crucifix floor plan, which otherwise known as a cruciform, which was considered a rather unusual style for colonial churches. Aquia was built to replace two earlier sites of the Overwharton Parish, which were constructed around 1680. The inside of the church burned down in 1754 and was not rebuilt until 1757. It was then shut down from the Revolutionary War until the Civil War due to lack of funding before reopening as a stable, campsite, and hospital for Union forces. It was during this closure that a young blonde woman was traveling the dark country roads, rural Stafford County, when a group of highwaymen accosted her. This time period was full of exasperated uncertainty from the war, and with it a severe lack of resources, food, and money. Men would wait hidden on the side of roads to steal the valuables from people walking or riding by their hiding spots. She ran from the men to the sanctuary of the church, but was only able to hide for a little while before they broke inside and ended her life. Her body was hidden in the tower, and the men were never caught. It wasn't until after the Revolutionary War ended in 1775, and the church was ready to reopen for services, that what was left of her was discovered. A skeleton with golden blonde hair that was as intact as if she had been freshly slain. The red fluid that spilled on the floor from her death was impossible to remove. Despite using every trick known to man, the stains remained in the tower for well over a hundred years, until during a modern renovation when the redness was covered up by concrete. With the facility still being in use today, members of the church have mentioned hearing footsteps walking around at all hours of the day and will break into a frantic run around the church at night, but no one is there. Noises can be heard in the empty tower, with some saying it sounds like a struggle, others describing a groan, whistle, or even a call for help. Many have also mentioned seeing a transparent woman in the church's windows, on the balcony, or even in the graveyard, dubbing her Blonde Beth after the hair of the skeleton. In the 1900s, brave people would try to stay overnight at the church, but were chased away by what they described as an unfriendly presence. A custodian working in the graveyard saw a ghostly woman's face floating above the graves, while another man saw a woman smiling at him through the balcony windows before she vanished. In the middle of this creepy sandwich, in third place, we're taking a closer look at St. Mary the Virgin, located on the outskirts of Clophill, England. Originally built facing the west sometime around the year 1350, it's believed to have been erected on top of a leper hospital run by monks. I'd like to take a moment to note that it was built in the quote-unquote wrong direction, with churches traditionally facing east, the direction from which the sun rises, which is associated with the location of heaven and the return of the Messiah in Christian religion. Altars inside of these holy buildings would face in the eastbound direction for prayers. Some have claimed that because St. Mary the Virgin faces away from God, it thus opens its doors to hell, and ergo responsible for the tale I'm about to tell. The building was abandoned in 1848, when the rector at the time made the decision to have a new church built, instead of 
expanding the previous one, which was much needed due to the rapidly growing congregation. Old St. Mary's, as was dubbed by the locals, was then primarily used as a mortuary chapel, holding bodies before they were buried in the adjacent cemetery. By the 1950s, St. Mary's had become so run down that it could no longer fulfill that use, with just the outdoor walls and tower remaining. In March 1963, the tomb of an 18th century apothecary's wife was broken into, and the bones were arranged ritualistically in the middle of the church. And once again on Midsummer's Eve of 1969, multiple women's graves were broken into, with bones being removed and rearranged once more. While the specific individuals involved in these acts were never identified, the arrangements found resembled those used in black mass rituals performed by satanic groups at the time. After the first incident in 1963, a rare decision was made to rehollow, or in more simple terms, re-bless the altar that was left in the building, in a failed attempt to protect the building from evil. Later that year, Reverend Harold Colthurst reported stumbling upon a group of men in the building that were in the midst of a mysterious ritual, being quoted as saying that the men were trying to communicate with evil spirits, chanting some sort of mumbo jumbo. They were definitely in league with the devil. Modern day visitors to the now landmark have reported seeing a plethora of ghostly figures during the day and nighttime, faint lights moving about before vanishing mysteriously, along with reports of a chilly and oppressive atmosphere even during warm days. In second place, we're visiting L'Abbé de Mortemer, or Mortimer Abbey. It was originally built in 1134 on land gifted by King Henry I. The stagnant water of the drainage lake, which was dug out by the monks to dry up the marshy land, was called Mortemer, or the dead pond, giving the monastery its name. Totally not ominous or anything. The monks constructed what was then one of the largest monasteries in the world on said land. The legend says that after the passing of his only son, King Henry wanted to reform his daughter Matilda and had her locked in a room in the abbey for five years. The anger and hate she felt from being sent away and isolated stained and seeped into the walls of the monastery, cursing it for eternity. After her eventual release, she went on to live until 1167, when it said her spirit returned to Mortimer Abbey to haunt the area as the White Lady. She is said to appear on nights close to a full moon, moaning as she drifts through the now ruins of the monastery. Those that have seen her report that she alternates between wearing black and white gloves. If she appears to you with white gloves on, you're destined for good luck. But if she appears with black, you'll be expected to pass within a year. Alas, Matilda is not the only spirit one must worry about if visiting the abbey. When the monastery was at its peak in the 1500s, a frail and suffering woman was brought to the monks with an illness it was believed that only they could aid. It was revealed that she was possessed by the spirit of a wolf and cursed to become a werewolf for several nights. The monks chained her to a room and conducted multiple exorcisms in an attempt to eradicate the spirit. The monks were able to exorcise the evil wolf spirit or demonic force out of the woman, but it then attached itself to the grounds and walls of the monastery. Several hundred years later in 1884, a man named Roger Sabaro was hunting in the woods nearby when he was attacked by a large werewolf. He shot it multiple times, killing the creature, but when he returned home at dawn, he found the body of his wife bearing wounds matching those he had given the wolf. People say the spirit of Roger's wife and his own heartbroken spirit still wander the area when the moon is full. The abbey was exorcised by the church in 1921, but still remains haunted to this day. And coming in first place, we have the Abbey of the Black Hag, locally known as Monastir Galagduff. Please don't curse me for my pronunciation. St. Catherine's Abbey, or simply as Old Abbey. It's located roughly two miles east of the village of Shanna Golden, in the townland of Old Abbey. Gee, can you tell where it got its name? <laughs> One of the earliest recorded nunneries in Ireland, with its first official record being around 1298, it was built on land donated by John Fitzthomas, and has the typical layout for abbeys of its time, with a dining hall, cells, isolated meditation areas, and other rooms still able to be identified amongst the runes today. During the 15th century, there was a major battle for supremacy in the area between the Earl Fitzgerald and the prestigious Butler family, of which the Earldom of Ormond belonged. It got to such an extent that the local bishop was known to pray for peace between the families at masses. During one of the nightly attacks, Earl Fitzgerald attempted to get his wife to safety, but as he was pulling her onto his horse, an arrow pierced her thigh, shattering the bone and spraying red bodily fluids. As he rode on, the Countess appeared to have succumbed to her injury, leading the Earl to seek sanctuary at St. Catherine's. The heartbroken man was certain his wife had passed, so he swiftly buried her between 
so he swiftly buried her beneath the altar and continued elsewhere to find safety. As the night went on, the nuns and residents began to hear hair-raising screams and made the decision to rebury the Countess in hopes of bringing her peace. When they dug up the body, they discovered her fingers were broken and her nails had been torn off. The poor woman had been buried alive with a very slow and torturous end of her life. To this day, it is believed that the Countess has been unable to find peace and continues to scream in anguish, waiting for her husband to save her from a fate truly worse than death. Moving slightly ahead in time, we come to the Black Nun herself. Described as one in the order that wasn't content with being humble, helping others over herself, and the servitude to God, she instead craved power. The Hag had her own cell, where she worshipped Satan and performed black magic, becoming a slave to the occult. This was the highest form of blasphemy in the church, and the other nuns in the order fled the abbey while the hag remained in her now house of darkness. To complete her rituals, the black nun would venture into the local community and perform depraved lewd acts and offer sacrifices, with bones of young community members later discovered on the grounds. In modern times, visitors have reported seeing the dark shadowy figure of a nun wandering, the feeling of being constantly watched, and a disembodied hand reaching towards them. It has been reported that flashlights cannot function in the nun's cell and modern batteries drain too quickly to have any sort of rational explanation. Number 5. St. Clair's Fingernails and Her Hair now, some people say that fingernails and hair continue to grow after the body passes away. This is commonly repeated, but actually not true, because rather it's the skin around the fingernails retracting that gives the illusion that the fingernails are still growing. I thought I would just toss in a totally unrelated fun fact you can use at a party. These fingernails aren't growing at all because they're not attached to anybody, and they're kept in a glass box alongside some of St. Clair's wonderful curls, like the world's worst and possibly stinkiest time capsule. Now, St. Clair was often overshadowed by her more famous mentor, Francis of Assisi, but St. Clair was her own woman, accomplished in her own right. She founded her own order of nuns, the Poor Clares. Inspired by Francis's teachings when she was a teenager, she renounced the world and founded an order based on the ideals of extreme poverty and contemplation. I should probably look into this order because being extremely broke and contemplating being extremely broke is about 99% of what I do. The order spread popularity and houses of Poor Clares were established far away from her home convent in Assisi. Now, it's said that part of what made St. Clair's decision to give up the worldly life so inspiring was that not only was she blessed to be born into a family of great wealth, but oh, va va voom, St. Clair was a real stunner. Now, you know, the depictions we have to work with may not look like much, but they called her the first Jenner for her luscious lips and flowing locks. As proof of her devotion, Frances trimmed her beautiful extravagant hair as a physical manifestation of rejecting her former vain existence. As you can see, I'm not quite there yet. I'm still quite happy with my vain, disgusting hair. Now, someone down the line managed to get a hold of St. Clair's hair and fingernails. Maybe they were just sweeping the barber room floor. These uh, treasures, for lack of a better word, were kept and encased in a reliquary at the basilica named in her honor. This also contains a rock crystal flask with her fingernails. Really not sure why anyone felt they needed to keep that. Uh, I'm not sure how holy these are, but hey, I'm not a saint or a bishop or a pope or any of that stuff. I'm just a YouTuber and I'm barely that even. But if you want to hear more of me narrating some of these strange and peculiar parts of the big globe we share, Top 5 Scary is the place to be. We got a little something for everyone. So make sure you click on through, like this video, subscribe and hit that little bell and we can keep on bringing you screams every single day, twice a day and then some. But do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more weird Catholic relics coming up for you. Number four, papal hearts. You know, they say some people wear their hearts on their sleeves, and some people collect 22 hearts in marble urns inside a beautiful reliquary. We all have our hobbies, we all collect things. Just make sure those hearts are still in their original packaging, otherwise, you know, they're totally worthless. Well, these aren't just regular old hearts, these are the hearts of 22 former popes. Obviously, obviously, they're former popes if their hearts are, obviously. <laughs> at the Church of Santi Vincenzo e Anastasio at Trivia. Oof, that's a mouthful. We're not saying that again. You can find the sealed hearts of 22 popes in marble urns for all to appreciate. The popes are listed to the left of the altar, with the oldest coming in all the way from the 15th century with Sixtus V to the fresh and still beating heart of Leo XIII in 1903. Now, this custom of separating a pope's organs from the corpse sounds a bit 
strange, or a bit Egyptian, like they might mummify them. And then this process was called precordia, and was done to prevent decay while funeral arrangements were made, and just to test a little bit if they were worried the pope was going to reanimate. The tradition started up in the 14th century when it was established that when a pope passed away, they would be mourned for nine days. Nine days, with suffrage messages being said each day. They borrowed this little schedule from the Byzantines, who observed deaths of their emperors in a very similar manner. Really taken a while off, they took a whole pay period to mourn the loss, and then you dry those tears right up, get back to work. Now, this was all the rage for popes of yesteryear, very trendy, very in fashion. But Pope Pius X in 1914 had a change of heart when he expressly forbade it in his burial and will. He said, don't do any of that weird stuff to me. Those were his exact words, if you can believe it. Now since then, his successors have all agreed and have all done the same. But who's to say? I feel this could be coming back in fashion. Pope Francis, how you feeling? You gotta listen to your heart on this one. Number three, the holy souls of purgatory. Purgatory, in Catholic belief, is kind of like a giant waiting room while the upper management figures out just where exactly they're going to find a good spot that's best for you. Well, that's simplifying it a bit, obviously. The soul is thought to be stranded in purgatory until it atones for its earthly sins, but you can hurry the process up just a little bit if your loved ones back on earth are praying for you. In the back of the Chiesa del Sacro Cure del Suffragio del Piccolo Museo del Purgatorio, or Museum of the Holy Souls in Purgatory, holds a collection of relics that have been singed by the hands of the souls of those trapped in purgatory. These burned handprints are believed to be the souls trying to communicate that their loved ones need to pray harder. I don't know about you, but I would definitely start praying real hard if burned handprints started showing up in my books, but I would be praying for an exorcist, more likely. Now, this is kind of interesting, and I didn't even know this. Purgatory isn't even mentioned directly in the Bible, but the concept of purgatory dates back to the 11th century. This notion that trapped souls needed to be freed came from a story told to the abbot Odillo of Cluny by a monk returning from the Holy Land. He told this story about how this ship had been wrecked, that he'd been cast ashore on a mysterious island, and a hermit who lived on the island related his own story of a chasm from which screams of trapped souls and demonic flames rose and ravaged. He told of how the demons would complain about losing souls when your loved ones would pray for their behalf. So November 2nd was established as All Souls Day. Everybody, all the souls. Where it was believed that prayers by the living could help get all of those trapped dead in purgatory loose. You know, it's kind of like that one episode of The Simpsons where the town comes together to get Bart out of the well. It's a, it's a similar enough concept, you know? They sang a song, you pray, souls get out, Bart gets out, pretty much one and the same. This particular collection of burned relics in particular though, was collected when Victor Jouet, the missionary behind the collection, experienced a fire that burned part of the original suffragio, leaving behind a scorched image of a face that he believed was a trapped soul. Now again, just me personally, but if I saw a face burned into one of my possessions, I would move entirely, call an exorcist, be putting salt circles around my feet for the rest of my life, but I appreciate what he did too. Number two, the Santa Maria della Concezione Crypts. Whew, they, my Italian is not as good as it should be. <laughs> Inside the Santa Maria della Concezione crypts, as many as 4,000 friars lie here. Well, lie is probably the wrong word, as they hang here is probably a more accurate description. As these 4,000 bodies are hanging from the rafters, decorating the space of every inch of the church. Now, it might seem a bit grim, or beautiful, depending on your twisted point of view. We're a scary channel, I ain't gonna judge you. There's a certain chic to it. But I wouldn't be surprised if they have to spend a few hundred a month on keeping air fresheners and incense just running all the time there. Now, you might reasonably be wondering, hey, why do they hang bones from the wall like they're throwing a Halloween party and no one went to the store to get actual decorations and they had to make do with what they had? Well, they're not just festive. The practice dates back from the 16th century when the Capuchin friars, not named after the monkey, but because of the hoods they wore, left the friary of St. Bonaventure to come live at Santa Maria della Concezione. They were ordered by the Pope's brother at the time to bring the remains of deceased friars with them to their new home so that all the Capuchins could lie together. With a huge amount amount of bodies on their hands, the brothers decided to get a little fun with it and decorate the walls of the crypts with their bones as a way of reminding them that death 
comes for all of them. Surely there's a slightly easier way to remind you of the ever present mortality that hangs over us than literally hanging a bunch of pelvises to the buttresses, but what do I know? A plaque in the crypt reads, what you are now, we once were. What we are now, you shall be. Which is, is grim. <laughs> No way around it. The crypt contains a little bit of everything inside you. Crypt of skulls, lovely load of leg bones, and the star of the show is definitely the crypt of pelvises. Oh, make sure you get a photo in there. Make sure you grab a fridge magnet from the pelvis room gift shop. And number one, St. John the Baptist's many heads. They say two heads are better than one, which might be proof of what a great man St. John the Baptist is, because no one can seem to agree how many heads the guy actually had. The saint's head was supposedly brought back from Constantinople in 1206 by the crusader Wallen de Satan, but it seems this happened more than a few times, since three different shrines across the globe all claim to have the original head of St. John the Baptist, and no one's able to clear this up anytime soon. St. John was a forerunner of Jesus Christ, and the New Testament says that John was beheaded by Herod around 28 CE as a punishment for criticizing his recent divorce. Yeesh. Paintings of the beheading depicted on a silver platter, which is a, a nice, nice way to get a severed head, I think. That's, I, I don't know if I ever want a head delivered to me, but if I had to, I would want it on a silver platter. According to the legend, there really was a silver platter his head was delivered on that made its way to Constantinople or Istanbul, but was sold by the Crusaders in order to pay for his travels back. John's head was on display in the Amiens Cathedral up until the French Revolution, where they confiscated all church treasures, and it would eventually return home in 1816, then going all the way back to Rome from Greek monks who brought it to a shrine decorated with beautiful stained glass, one panel depicting the head on a silver platter. You think you wouldn't want to remember that. Well, here's where the trouble comes in. A German museum in Munich also takes great pride in having St. John's head. The Munich Residence Museum contains a bunch of other holy relics, but their most prized is the alleged St. John's head, although no one really knows how it got there. This skull is wrapped in cloth and heavily interred with gems. Now two would be impressive. But St. John's got a crowd worth of heads because he's got three. His last head can be found in Damascus, Syria in the Umad Mosque, one of the oldest and largest mosques in the world. This relic, also not exposed, wrapped in a cloth, and is currently located in a shrine dedicated to the saint. So will the real John the Baptist please stand up? Or do all three of these heads actually really belong to him and he had to be beheaded three times for it to take? You know what, don't answer that. I'm not sure if that's something I really want to know. Number five, Benito Mussolini. Now, the Vatican isn't just the seat of the Catholic Church. Did you know that actually the Vatican is the smallest country in the world? Despite the fact that it does exist inside Rome, inside Italy, the Vatican technically is not part of Italy, but rather its own sovereign little country. About a thousand people live there total, but it hasn't always been this way. And the reason that it became that way is a little darker than I'm sure the church would like to admit. It was a treaty with fascist leader Benito Mussolini. In 1922, Mussolini and the National Fascist Party came to power in Italy, crushing democracy and putting up a pretty hostile dictatorship in its place. In 1929, Mussolini and the church came together to have a little meet and greet and sign a treaty, granting the church status as a private enclave, a sovereign state inside of Italy. Mussolini Mussolini wouldn't bother the Vatican, and they wouldn't bother him. Mussolini even paid out a massive, massive settlement which the church invested and is believed to be valued at around 780 million US dollars. Alongside tax exemption and priests getting a nice salary from the Italian government. All of those benefits you can thank a fascist government for. Perhaps most illuminating, however, was a clause that protected the Vatican's dignity, meaning as part of their laws as a sovereign state, they were allowed to arrest and try anyone who criticized the people and the church. In exchange for signing this treaty, the Catholic Church publicly supported the fascist dictatorship and was recognized as Italy's official government. The Vatican's own newspaper printed shortly after the deal went down, Italy has been given back to God and God to Italy. And they only have the support of someone who is involved in hundreds of thousands of deaths to thank. And if you're looking for way more strange, true things out of history, conspiracies about the Catholic Church, cryptids, aliens, and all sorts of freaky business. Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. So click on through 
Hit subscribe, please make sure to hit that bell so you get everything and do not miss a single screen. But you do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more Catholic Church secrets coming up. Number four, the treacherous Pope Boniface. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. This idea being that none of us are truly free of sin and we're all born into this world natural sinners. Well, some people really take that idea and really run with it. And you would be surprised how high up the Catholic Church some of these troublemakers get. That's where Pope Boniface VII comes in, one of history's most notorious popes for his incredibly unholy behavior. Pope Boniface was actually so wildly controversial that Dante Alighieri wrote in The Inferno that Pope Boniface was condemned to the eighth circle of hell where the frauds were kept. It's a really good window into the sort of general mindset of the population that in their books they were imagining all the ways he'd be tormented in hell. And as a quick aside, for the comment section, Dante's Inferno, is that history's first fan fiction? There's a very serious argument to be made that it is. Anyway, Boniface saw the destruction of Palestrina, a city that had already peacefully surrendered and submitted, but that wasn't good enough for the church. Palestrina had already been burned to the ground, and goofy old Pope Boniface ordered that they plow it down to the dirt and soil to ensure that absolutely nothing of the city remained standing, a real salt of the earth approach. He was definitely a guy who loved his neighbors. He really loved his neighbors, in the sense that the, the vow of celibacy that men of the cloth have to swear to, Boniface didn't really like believe in at all. He was alleged to engage in all kinds of parties with all manner of bedroom companions, having once stated that he felt intercourse with younger people was as natural as hands rubbing together. A really, really great guy all together, and he also loved building statues of himself all the time, so he was very prideful, which that, that's the worst sin of them all. Really. Number three, Galileo. Science and religion do have a place alongside one another in the world, I think. Now, science and religion have had a complicated history, you know, they never quite seen eye to eye, kind of always furrowing their brows and glaring at each other through the hallways, but one could never truly disprove wholly the existence of God through science, and I think science can illuminate and, and shine new light on, on ways to glorify religion, right? Maybe? Well, not particularly. As, as one could imagine, there's a great deal of difficulty the church has with science. In 1633, Galileo Galilei, the renowned astronomer, made himself an enemy of the Catholic Church and God for having the unbelievable, blasphemous, heretical viewpoint that the Earth orbits the Sun and not the other way around. Now, Galileo didn't quite have it all the way, since he did posit that the Sun is the center of the universe, and he wasn't super right about that, but hey, Give the guy a little credit. He was doing all this before the TI-84, okay? He was just looking up in the sky making all these guesses. Pretty smart guy. Was doing better than most astronomers out there. Now for this most heinous, disgusting, unbelievably sinful crime, Galileo was arrested and put on trial where 10 cardinals sat before him passing judgment and trying to decide how best to punish this disgusting heretic, floating some fun ideas like imprisonment for life, torment, being burned at the stake. Again, this is all because Galileo suggested how the planets work, and he was mostly right about this, which is important to hammer home. Eventually, Galileo renounced his beliefs, saying he was wrong, and he was getting up there in age, and didn't want to spend the rest of his life suffering. So in an act of true humble forgiveness, the church instead decreed that instead of being burned or anything, Galileo be condemned to spend the rest of his days in his home, which he did until his passing. That'll teach him. Now eventually, obviously, the church kind of had to walk back some of that treatment of Galileo. In 1992, they spoke out saying that maybe he was kind of technically right about like a few things here and there and mumbled out an apology like a schoolyard bully being forced to say sorry by the teachers. Sure, it was about 350 years too late, but I bet Galileo probably really appreciated it and would have loved to have known how vindicated by history he would have been. Number two, the wild and wacky life of Pope Benedict the Ninth. Over the years, there have been many, many controversial popes. I mean, there's a bunch on this list already. In fact, you'd probably find more popes are wrapped in controversy than you might imagine. Now, it's pointless to compare sins on any sort of moral scale as to who's the most evil or, or the worst pope, but it's hard to argue that few of them got up to as much chaos and trouble as Pope Benedict IX, who was one of the wackiest, most notorious popes out there. He once sold the position because he got bored of it. It's said he began his pontification when he was a young, young man because his wealthy family just wanted it, and that was like a thing you could do back then. If you had enough money, you could just bribe the church and ask that your son become pope. Benedict loved the lifestyle and behaved the way Joffrey Baratheon would, 
you know, kind of really letting the power get to his head almost immediately. He would spend his money on women of the night, hosting lecherous, wild, erotic parties, which allegedly would have all manner of man, woman, and if the stories are to be believed, animals as well. It was not long before there were conspiracies being drawn up to assassinate the Pope, if you can believe that. Even just saying that feels weird, but they wanted to assassinate the Pope. Probably in a case of divine intervention or, or fate, on a feast day, his enemies snuck into St. Peter's Basilica carrying rope, ready to tangle up the Pope. But a solar eclipse scared the assassins so badly they called the whole thing off, and to be honest, I totally get it. If I was planning on disposing the Pope and the sun got blocked out, I'd assume God was furious at me. Failed coups notwithstanding, Pope Benedict's reputation did not improve much. He was attacked by an angry mob in 1045, and he was forced to flee and would be replaced by another Pope, one Sylvester III. Two months later, however, Benedict would return to take the title back. But two months later, he decided that he didn't really enjoy being Pope anymore. It wasn't as fun, what with all the constant bombardment of hate and failed attempts on his life. So he sold it to his godfather for what amounted to nearly $30 million. Imagine buying the Pope. Imagine buying being the voice of God. Anyway, if you can believe it, like Emperor Palpatine, somehow Pope Benedict returned a third time. King Henry III of Germany had arrested Pope Sylvester III for being a false pope, and the godfather that he'd sold the throne to had given up the papacy, admitting that it was shameful and heretical for him to have ever done so in the first place. So Henry appointed a new German pope while Benedict was in hiding, and that pope mysteriously passed away eight months later from a poisoning which many historians suspect Benedict had his little fingers in. So Benedict came back for a third time to be the Pope, only this time no one was putting up with him. They'd been through this two more times, they weren't doing it again. Henry III sent troops to drag him out of the basilica. He spent his dying years in a monastery and is now remembered in history as one of the worst popes ever. And number one, the Pazzi Conspiracy. If you've garnered anything from this video that I've been telling you, I sincerely hope it's that the Pope doesn't always follow the rules. Sure, the guy interprets the will of God, you know, he's got a direct line to talking to him, but that doesn't mean he follows every single one of his rules. Now we've already discussed some of the wildest sins that Popes have been caught up in, but let's top it all off with a full-blown assassination conspiracy revolving around the Pope ordering a hitman. No, really. In the 1470s, Pope Sixtus IV hatched a scheme to rid Florence of the Medicis, the most influential family in the country at the time rivaling the church. The Medicis had served as the bankers for the papacy for generations and as such were loaded. Pope Sixtus kickstarted this conflict when he changed the Medicis over as the bankers to the Pazzi family who were more loyal to him. The Medicis didn't want to pay to help the Pope claim the town of Imola which the Medicis themselves wanted to lord over. So with these in the way the Pope thought that something had to be done about these meddling Medicis. So Sixtus contracted two assassins to carry out the plot against Lorenzo and Giuliano de' Medici during Easter Mass on Sunday, which just feels unbelievably disrespectful if you're the Pope, you know? You can't talk in church, but you can orchestrate a political assassination. That's fine to do on Sunday, on Easter Sunday. Now, if you're sitting here listening to this and you're kind of scratching your head because you feel like all of this sounds a bit familiar, imagine you have a white hood on and you're jumping into a bale of hay because this was a driving plot line in Assassin's Creed 2 where protagonist Ezio ends up helping out Lorenzo Medici a great deal. Yeah, no, the games were really inspired by true history, you know, save for a few extendo blades and boss fights against the Pope but a lot of that stuff really did happen. History is just as weird as the video games make it out to be. Now, if you remember from Assassin's Creed 2, Giuliano was fatally slain, but Lorenzo survived and rallied support of Florence in a war against the church. Lorenzo picked off conspirators and then sailed to Naples to meet King Ferdinand to discuss a peaceful solution to the bubbling war. There's a reason they called him Il Magnifico. This guy was great at strategy. In the end, the plot failed drastically because all it really did was cement people's support to Lorenzo Medici. People loved the fact that he survived an assassination. They made a medal commemorating this for him, and it brought shame to Pope Sixtus, and it inspired one of the best games Ubisoft ever put out. Number five, a time machine. Among the many conspiracies about what goods are hidden inside the Vatican's secret archives, one of the more popular and reoccurring ones is that the Vatican has access to 
wondrous technology hidden away from the rest of the world, from ancient civilizations, stuff like that. One leading theory is that among these devices is something called the Chronovisor, an alleged time machine of sorts that allows the user to peer inside and see whatever time period in history or forwards they desire, like a little time camera. Doctor Who would love it. One Italian monk, one Pellegrino Ernetti, claimed that he developed the Chronovisor at some point during the 1950s with a team of 12 esteemed scientists who all wish to remain anonymous in the process. I would put my name on that if I invented time travel, personally. I'd want people to know. The Chronovisor is described as consisting of antennas and uh, an unknown metal that's really good at looking through time, a little knob for tuning to a particular time and place, and a screen and recording device. Ernetti described that he and his team used this machine to view speeches by Mussolini and Napoleon, scenes from ancient Rome, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, which they allegedly tried to take a photo of. Now, obviously, no one's seen the chronovisor. If such a device was to exist, it would naturally be pretty secretive. An Italian magazine in the 1970s claims that they found that image of Christ's crucifixion, the photo that was taken through time, only to discover that it was actually just a postcard. So, this one's a bit up in the air. Let me know if you think this is real, but also, you know what? Let me know what time period you would want to take a picture of, if you could see that up close. And if you're looking for way more scary content, my friends, my friends, you already know Top 5 Scary is the place to be. We've got everything scary under the sun. Cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, fake crime, aliens, UFOs, just about anything freaky you can think of. So click on through, subscribe, stay scared, and don't miss a single thing. But Keep watching this video too, okay? We worked hard on it. Number four, the three secrets of Fatima. Over a hundred years ago, three young people in Portugal from the town of Fatima claimed that they were visited by the Virgin Mary herself in a vision and the Madonna shared with them wondrous prophecies and visions onto them. These visions, allegedly, were the Second World War, the rise and fall of communism, and the death of a pope. And these were referred to as the three secrets of Fatima. Very cool prophecy stuff. Now. Story goes that the Madonna would visit these three shepherds every six months on the 13th day of each month on the dot. She was very punctual. Influenza would end up claiming the lives of two of these prophets, leaving only one to share messages with the world, and then only briefly too. Conspiracies and conspiracists state that the things the Virgin Mary told the shepherds weren't quite reported on accurately, and in truth, the church knows the real secrets that were bestowed upon the Fatimans, and that these were way too dangerous to be let out, and had to be suppressed and controlled for fear of civil unrest, possibly pertaining to things that could damage the church's good reputation, or change the nature of society as a whole. Maybe the answer as to whether or not that dress was white and black or gold and blue the whole time. An alternate conspiracy is that there were more secrets that the church knows about but refuses to share. Maybe four secrets of Fatima. That makes sense. They're called the secrets of Fatima, not the tell everybody's of Fatima. You want my theory? My conspiracy? Virgin Mary told those shepherds of Fatima the recipe for KFC and Coke and the Vatican realized quickly that information is just too sensitive. That's got to stay under wraps. Number three, proof of aliens. Well, we already talked a little bit about some of the credible technology that could be inside this archive. And it's thought that the Vatican has all sorts of incredible information hidden away in its vaults that humanity we're just not ready to know about. We're not grown up enough. One of the other leading ones is that theorists speculate that inside those secret, secret archives is indisputable hard evidence of extraterrestrial life. That they're harboring alien skulls and remnants of amazing technology, I guess on borrow from Area 51's collection it's traveling. So the story goes that in the late 1960s, during renovations of the Vatican's archives, excavators uncovered alien skulls beneath the Vatican archives, and somewhere the predator is so upset that he lost those. Is it possible that they worried that if proof of extraterrestrial life got out into the wild, it would discredit belief? Yeah, out there. It wouldn't be the first time, you know, Galileo was famously locked up for his wild beliefs about the celestial bodies that would turn out to be fairly true. So would aliens be any different, really a different story? A Russian engineer named Genrik Marvikic Ludwig was an esteemed scholar who in the 1920s was invited to the secret archives to study. A very prestigious position offered to like less than a thousand scholars a year. According to him, while there, he uncovered documentations that discussed the influence of aliens on civilizations like the Egyptians, 
the Mayans, the Mesopotamians. Ludwig found records of use of atomic weaponry predating the Manhattan Project, suggesting that this hyper advanced technology had been in use for years and humanity's leaps and progress were all reverse engineered from our visitors. Maybe the pyramids really were aliens. <laughs> Would certainly be something if that ever came out. I hope in our lifetime, you know, I hope we get to see some aliens and I hope we get to see an alien elected pope someday personally. Number two, proof Jesus never existed or did. Now among the things that you would think the Vatican would really want to keep hidden and on the DL would be proof that the Lord and Savior did not exist. This is another popular conspiracy theory emanating about the Vatican that one of the things they're trying to cover up is some alleged document that insists Jesus as we know him wasn't quite real or wasn't as reported accurately. That would make sense. If I was the Pope, that would be like the number one thing I would want to keep under wraps, right? That would probably destroy the church overnight if that ever came out. Now on the inverse of this theory is a similar theory, totally different direction though, stating that the Vatican secret archives contains indisputable proof that Jesus did exist, including correspondences between Saint Paul and Emperor Nero, history's favorite bad boy, contemporary paintings and depictions of the man, which would be pretty groundbreaking. You'd wonder though, if they, if they have that, why would they keep that secret? You know, I would, I would leak that one. Now, if you believe this conspiracy and you can carry on with it, it does get a little wild. One author, one Michael Bagnet, claims that the correspondences inside the archives, they prove Jesus did exist, but here's a crazy twist. He didn't die on the cross, as you know, we all know, but rather there was a very complicated scheme with Pontius Pilate to secretly fake Jesus' death to appease the citizens of Rome. Sounds a little bit more like the plot line to a Dan Brown novel. It's a little fantastical, and if true, would probably be the greatest conspiracy theory in, in human history and maybe humanity's most tightly guarded secrets if there's any weight to it. So definitely, you know, if they knew that, they would probably keep that under wraps, keep that in a drawer, <laughs> locked up tight, not let anybody see that. And number one, the Illuminati. Maybe this is one of the most widespread conspiratorial beliefs, maybe one of the oldest conspiracy theories out there, really is that the Illuminati, the centuries old secret society that once started in Bavaria would eventually grow into an organization capable of challenging the church and overtaking it. And if you believe the conspiracies, it's clandestinely pulling the strings behind everything, controlling the world from the shadows, inserting key members of its order into the highest levels of government, religion, the Disney corporation, the rap industry, and also including their symbols hidden in everything. That one, I guess, just for like fun, <laughs> just to, I don't know, flex. May I just say though, if the Illuminati are real and, and controlling things, they have got to be the least kept secret order like imaginable since, you know, I'm talking about them. <laughs> Well, the conspiracy goes that the Vatican is closely, closely tied with the Illuminati, with some believing that cardinals and the papacy are all tied to Illuminati interests, and that the secret archives contain bountiful proof of this, memos, meetings, plans for world domination, etc. The Vatican's archives date back centuries, nearly a thousand years worth of old papers, with some documents containing secrets of the Knights Templar, who are thought to be the originators of Freemasonry, the group that would become tied with the Illuminati, that's who the Illuminati was based on. Surely some of those Knight Templar meeting minutes would be particularly illuminating, if you'll pardon that absolutely horrible pun. Of all the ones on this list, I think this one is the most outright likely, since we know the Illuminati did stem from the Freemasons and we know that there was a real Illuminati, that's an indisputable fact, and we know the Knights Templar, we know all of these groups did exist and it's very likely that there are some secrets inside the Vatican's archive containing references to those three groups that could fuel the plot lines for the next 12 years of Assassin's Creed games. We got some good conspiracy stuff in there. Kicking off this list in fifth place, we have the possibility of proof of alien life. In 1998, news reports emerged that strange, elongated, distinctly alien looking skulls had been found during a restoration of the Vatican Library, with many suggesting that the Vatican secret archives must be hiding evidence of extraterrestrials. Perhaps an understanding between the Vatican and extraterrestrials is too far out there, too convenient to contemplate. 
except the Vatican itself does not run from ties to aliens. Consider the words of Cardinal Conrado Balducci, a high-ranking Vatican official since the 1960s and close friend to many popes, who in 1998 instructed followers to remember a paragraph of the New Testament where St. Paul refers to Christ as King of the Universe, not only as King of the World. That means that all beings in the universe, including aliens, are reconcilable with God. Heck, the current pope has said he would baptize an alien, so I guess that's progress for the church? You tell me. In fourth place, we have conscience court. Yep, the Vatican has a secret court for sins based on conscience. Not proof, not evidence, but absolution from conscience. The bishops who handle such hearings are the Apostolic Penitentiary, also known as the Tribunal of Conscience. Created by Pope Alexander in 1179, it was a secret to the public until 2009. Wow, a secret they kept from the general public? Consider me less than surprised. The sins judged in this court vary from spitting out the desecration of a communion wafer to priests breaking their vows of celibacy. Spitting out communion's a sin? News to me. I can think of a lot of icky priests that should go to real court for how they broke their vows, not a court where they're simply forgiven. Sinners who seek absolution have to write a petition to the Holy See. They use pseudonyms to protect their identities and submit the petition to the tribunal. The tribunal considers the matter, but the decision making lies with the major penitentiary. And if he is uncertain, then he submits the matter to the Pope. Until about the 18th century, heinous crimes such as ending lives and fornication against will were judged by the tribunal. Sure, let's give Father whatever his name is a slap on the wrist so he can have a clear conscience about breaking serious laws and go back to his biggest concern about having a perfect life after passing. Because that's the priority for serious crimes. Same with using a fake name for protection. Really great. In third place, time to talk about exorcisms. While I'm sure someone out there is chuckling, exorcisms are nothing to be taken lightly. They're a religious or a spiritual practice of evicting demons, jinns, or other malevolent spiritual entities from a person or an area that is believed to be possessed. It varies a bit from religion to religion, so bear with me while I specify how it works in the Catholic Church. In Catholicism, exorcisms are performed in the name of Jesus Christ. There's a distinction between major exorcisms and minor exorcisms. Minor exorcisms are included in some blessings in which priests create sacramentals such as blessed salt. A related practice is deliverance ministry. Now the distinction between deliverance ministry and exorcism is that exorcism is conducted by priests who are given special permission from the Catholic Church, while deliverance ministry is prayer for people People who are distressed and wish to heal emotional wounds, including those purposely caused by evil spirits. The Catholic rite for a formal exorcism, called a major exorcism, is given in section 11 of Ritual Romanum. The ritual lists guidelines for conducting an exorcism and for determining when a formal exorcism is required. Priests are instructed to carefully determine that the nature of the condition is not actually a psychological or physical illness before proceeding. Sure, I'd love to see their criteria. In Catholic practice, the person performing the exorcism, known as an exorcist, must be an ordained priest. The exorcist recites prayers according to the rubrics of the rite and makes use of religious materials such as icons, sacramentals, and holy relic. The exorcist revokes God, specifically the name of Jesus Christ, as well as saints of the church triumphant and the archangel Michael to intervene with the exorcism. According to Catholic understanding, several weekly exorcisms over many years are sometimes required to expel a deeply entrenched demon. St. Michael's prayer against Satan and the rebellious angels, attributed to Pope Leo, is considered the strongest prayer of the Catholic Church against cases of diabolical possession. The Holy Rosary also has an exorcistic and intercessory power. Cool, maybe I'll go get my rosary one of these days. Holy water is a common aid for exorcism. Its use belongs to the prayer to St. Michael. The chief exorcist of the Vatican, Father Gabriel Amorth, stated that he had performed tens of thousands of exorcisms over his 60 plus years as a priest. Oh my gosh. Additionally, popes have performed exorcisms. Father Amor states that in 2009, Pope Benedict slammed Satan out of two guys, and in 2000, Pope John Paul II attempted to exorcise a woman, but failed to do so. Father Amor later witnessed the possessed woman crawling out the walls like a spider. Interesting. In Roman Catholicism, exorcism is a sacramental, but not a sacrament. Unlike baptism, confession, first communion. Unlike a sacrament, exorcism's integrity and efficiency do not depend on the rigid use of an unchanging formula or the ordered sequence of prescribed actions. Its efficiency depends on two elements, authorization from valid and illicit church authorities and the faith of the exorcist. Ever since the rise of the popularity of exorcisms in the movie of, you know, similar name, the church has tried hiding that they still practice them, but we know better. Number two on our list is the Vatican Bank. Yeah, totally not suspicious at all. Buckle in because there is a lot to unpack here. Formerly known as the Institute for the Works of Religion, the Institute, or the IOR for short, was founded in June 1942 by papal degree of Pope Pius XII. Guess when they presented their first public operations report? Nope, not 1943. 
Try again, I'll wait. Nope, not even in the 1900s. 2013. Yeah, you heard me correctly. 70 freaking years later, they produced their first annual report. You know, the thing that's supposed to be presented every year so no one does anything shady or illegal. Previous to this, all internal ledgers were destroyed every 10 years in accordance with their policy. So did they exist or not? The IOR's role is to safeguard and administer property intended for works of religion or charity. The bank accepts deposits only from top church officials and entities, and is run by a president but overseen by five cardinals who report directly to the Vatican and the Vatican Secretary of State. So they only report to themselves. For reference, all banks that operate in Canada have to report to the Minister of Finance. Former bank president Ettore Tedeschi and the Vatican Bank have been investigated on two separate occasions for money laundering. Yeah, nobody saw that coming. In March of 2012, JP Morgan Chase closed a Vatican account in Milan after the IOR was unable to respond to questionable money transfers. In 2010, Italian authorities seized 30 million from a Vatican account at Italy's Credito Artigiano Spa following allegations that the IOR violated anti money laundering laws. Ettore and the bank were both denied wrongdoing and no charges were ever filed. The money was released after IOR promised to pass measures to come into full compliance with international standards on money laundering and terrorism financing. Yeah, those measures, as of 2023, still have not been passed. In September of 2019, German Cardinal Reinhard Marx, who was in charge of the Vatican's Economic Council, confirmed that Pope Francis had instructed him to reduce costs in an effort to eliminate a deficit that is estimated to be around 70 million euros. Don't get excited! That's not a concrete number from them, because that would be, you know, too transparent. The exact amount is up for debate, because the Vatican has not published a budget since 2015 and has been without an in-house auditor for two years. Part of me will I uh, slowly blink here. The Vatican enjoys a property tax break for all non-commercial properties containing a chapel. So using this loophole between the years 2006 and 2011, the Vatican evaded taxes that amounted to about 4 billion euros. The European Court of Justice ruled this illegal, and the Vatican had to cough up 4 billion euros as post-dated tax. Sure, because every normal organization has that kind of money just lying around. The Vatican did not entirely pay for evading taxes, and it's argued that if you take into account the taxes they evaded dating back to 1992, the total amount's going to be over 13 billion euros. That's right, billion. On the 28th of June in 2013, three people were arrested by the Italian police on suspicion of corruption and fraud, having planned to smuggle 20 million in cash from Switzerland into Italy. One of those people arrested was Monsignor Nunzio Scarano, previously senior accountant at APSA, the Vatican's administration of the Patrimony of the Apostolic See. Try saying that five times fast. In January of 2014, he was further charged with money laundering through IOR accounts in yet another investigation. I'm seeing a pattern here. Are you? According to a police statement, millions of euros in false donations from offshore companies had moved through his accounts. Already in July of 2013, the IOR had frozen the money in his accounts. In July of 2016, Nunzio was acquitted of allegations of corruption, but was given a two-year sentence after being convicted of lesser charges of making false allegations. His money laundering trial in his hometown of Salerno was still pending at this time. The other person arrested was a bank person and a former Secret Service agent. In February of 2017, a court in Rome convicted two former top Vatican bank officials, Paolo Ciprani and Massimo Tulioff, for omissions in communications involving three small transfers. Paolo was a former Vatican bank director, and Massimo was his former deputy. They were, however, acquitted of a more serious money laundering charge, which involved 60 million in transfers, and were sentenced to four months and 10 days in prison. They were also forced to return $6,000 each. Oh, so glad they had to return so much of that money. In 2018, Vatican prosecutors indicted former Vatican Bank president Angelo Coloia and an attorney, Gabriele Uzo, for embezzling 62 million and using a real estate scam between 2001 and 2006. Oh yeah, totally a safe bank to put money in. And in first place, we have some unethical history German stuff. Thanks to guidelines, I have a lovely dictionary of words I cannot say, so I'll try to give you all a little list right now. Yahtzee's gonna represent a group that carries about, you know, a very distinct flag, and evil dictator Schmiedler is their leader. But I'll just use evil dictator or cruel dictator. I hope y'all can follow along, cause things are about to get dicey. Remember that bank I just talked about? Yeah, time to get even more in depth. A filed lawsuit claims that during the dictator's reign, the Vatican Bank received at least 200 million Swiss francs from his puppet Utasha regime, money that his followers allegedly looted from groups of people they set out to um, eliminate. The class action suit, headed up by attorney Keelan Friesen at Minneapolis law firm Zimmerman Reed, involves 2,000 plaintiffs who are seeking an accounting of purported funds as well as restitution that can amount to around $200 million. 
The claim also names, you know, unidentified Swiss, Austrian, Argentine, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and German banking institutions. Where plaintiff's lawyers say some of the plunder may have been routed to help the war criminals escape to Argentina. The suit relies on once classified documents from various countries that have been made public in recent years, as well as a 1998 US government report issued by Commerce Undersecretary Stuart Eisenstadt. Some of the report's most damning evidence appears in a 1946 intelligence memo from a US Treasury agent named Emerson Bigelow, who states that the Swiss francs were held in, you guessed it, the Vatican for safekeeping. The Vatican has constantly denied allegations of receiving Yahtzee gold and said in its internal review that they showed no trace of such funds. Sure, I'm totally going to trust the internal review from a bank that destroyed their records for 70 years before going public. One of the reasons the Vatican has been criticized is that it refuses to open its archives as others have done. A key figure in helping the Utashi was Krunoslav Draganovic, a Croatian priest who was head of the College of San Girolamo in Rome. Men from Croatia who wanted to become priests lived at San Girolamo while studying for ordination. After World War II, the college served as a safe house for the Usashi underground. It is alleged that Draganovic had aided the military and civilian leaders who had been in power in Croatia and committed war crimes. His assistance consisted in obtaining false documents and safe passage out of Italy. People write that there are allegations that he used his Vatican bank connections to launder gold stolen by, you guessed it, and that he was paid for his cooperation. He admitted in a 1945 that he had personally moved 40 kilos of Utashi gold to Rome, concealed in two packing cases. A request made under the Freedom of Information Act resulted in the 1997 release of Bigelow's report. Criminal conduct described in the report led to the institution of a 1999 lawsuit against the Vatican Pink. Criminal conduct described in the report led to the institution of a 1999 lawsuit against the Vatican Bank, filed by survivors and its descendants. The lawsuit was dismissed in 2009 under terms of the Sovereign Immunities Act. Although the legal case no longer stands, moral questions surrounding the plunder remain. Yeah, I've got a few questions of my own. Now, ever since allegations concerning the Vatican Bank and the Croatian plunder became public, requests have been made to the Vatican to allow access to archival documents from the time of Pope Pius. Pius was Pope from 1939 until 58, and if there's anything, it would be found on documents from his papacy if they still exist. According to Gerald Posner in God's Bankers, following tradition, documents relevant to Pope Pius could have been made public on March 12th of 2014, 75 years after his election as Pope, but you guessed it, the date passed without any release of those documents. At a 1997 conference on looted Yahtzee gold in London, the Vatican was the only one of 42 countries that rebuffed all requests for archival access. At a 1998 restitution summit in Washington, it ignored an emotional plea by U.S. Secretary of State and stood aside as 44 countries approved an ambitious plan to return, you know, icky looted art and property, settle unpaid life insurance claims, and reaffirm the call for open access to that time era archives. Subsequent pleas for opening the files by Bill Clinton, the State Department, and other organizations went unanswered. Enthusiasm over a 1999 Vatican announcement to allow Jewish historians into the wartime archives was short-lived. Access was limited to 5,000 documents that had been selected and published years earlier by four hand-picked academics. And now that I trust the Vatican even less than I did before, that brings us to the end of our list. Seriously, what's with all the secrecy? There's so much they refuse to talk about, even though it would benefit the greater good of society. Also, collaborating with heinous groups throughout history? Major yikes.